this excess savings conversation, from our perspective, is starting to run out. The rocket fuel for consumer spending is coming in in a <clears throat> dramatically slower fashion going forward. To say that we've already drawn it down, we're headed into a liquidity crisis, I think is a little bit premature. We're gonna have to see growth weaker for central banks to hit their targets, and that's not yet reflected in earnings. We've got shoes to drop that we have to wait for in 2023. It's too early. We haven't seen the capitulation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Ramo's back. Week yeah. begins on a Tuesday. You, you know. noticed that, TK. She, she, was, you she, had all, she had all four stores at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 57th Street. You make the circle there. Three day weekends for Lisa. You know, some the started Bulgari, others started Tiffany. yesterday. You're projecting, you know. Tom. Great Thank to have you, you back. Thank you. <laughs> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. With Tom Keen and Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures right now unchanged on the S&P 500. TK, we need to work out. Is this economy speeding up or slowing down? Yeah, I think that's a conundrum here, and, and uh, it's in the literature this morning. It's in the market this morning as well. And I, I'm sorry, the Fed's, their head is spinning here. We've got, you know, you, you got the global inflation we'll talk about in a moment with OECD coming out moments ago. The domestic inflation story is a mystery of the path down to what, John? And a lot of it has to do with are we slowing or not? The growth story is a mystery for me. Bramo, if you think about Friday, upside surprise on payrolls, the ISM yesterday picking up in a way that I don't think many people anticipated. I didn't see it. Yeah. Neil Dutter of Renmac has been all over this for the last couple of weeks and he had more to say yesterday. And we're seeing even the likes of Paul Krugman come out and say, when the facts change, I change. This shows an acceleration that we were not expecting. You're hearing that in a lot of different economic corners. I was looking at this one data point, that core goods account for just more than one-fifth of the consumer price index. So core goods are disinflating. The rest of the world, the services world, not so much. Neil Dutter says this, Tom, the slowdown story is becoming increasingly stale. What do you make of that gun? It's a year end. I, 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 well, I'm in the camp with Neil, where I have the optimism of a Neil Dotted, Jim Glassman's on the same page over at J.P. Morgan, and many, many others as well. And I just think we staggered, John, from every report, and we're going up to an inflation report, again, witness OECD today, that is frankly more important than the jobs report we just had. CPI, December 13th, and the Federal Reserve, December 14th. Need to keep an eye on layoffs as well. The latest coming from Dow Jones, the Wall Street Journal, yeah. indicating that PepsiCo will lay off hundreds, Lisa, from the headquarters. So it's the headquarters where we're going to see the hit potentially from that company and not the first and likely won't be the last in the next couple of months. There was another Wall Street Journal story in the past couple of weeks talking about how the layoffs have come much more in the white collar space than in the blue collar space, that the people who actually do the work, the real economy, is still necessary in a way that perhaps some of the office jobs are uh, not. One of the, the researchers over the night, John, very quickly here, Tom Porcelli at RBC Capital Markets. And you know my theme of the x-axis? Sure. The timing, Purcelli is heated. He's expert on wage dynamics. He's heated. The, the word he uses is grind. The labor deterioration grind is going to take forever to get where Chairman Powell wants to be. The so-called rebalancing that his Fed desires. Out. Further out. out. Let's get the price action for you. Whip through things briefly. The equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Unchanged. Futures <clears throat> going nowhere. Yesterday, biggest one-day loss on the S&P <clears throat> in about a month. Mike Wilson, can we please have your crystal ball yeah. over at Morgan Stanley? What, what, what was the right why on the I mean, loss? Was come, it the ISM PM? <laughs> ISM came out hot, yeah. yields blasted higher. We've got to move on to your yields that we didn't get on Friday after payrolls. And the curve inversion, deepest curve inversion, going back to the early and 1980s. And it's back there again. We came back negative 80 basis points. Is it about global growth with West Texas Intermediate? Well under $80, $76, 15 a barrel. $76 right now. And Lisa, just briefly, your tenure, 356 25 I do love it that Mike Wilson comes out and says, it's over, and the market tanks. It's almost like he does kind of have this telepathic uh, view into the markets. Today, what we're looking at, Georgia Senate's uh, runoff election with uh, Democrat Raphael Warnock facing off with Republican Herschel Walker. Very curious to see the outcome of this, in part because of the fact that people view it as a referendum on the trump back candidate. Also, because it merely marks the difference, not necessarily of the the majority in the Senate, but a 51-49 mix, which could be more significant for policy. Today, there is the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference. Shanali Basik is going to be speaking with the Goldman Sachs CEO, David Solomon. Uh, that is going to be in about two hours' time. Also, uh, CEO Brian Moynihan later in the morning. And President Biden is visiting Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company's construction site in Phoenix. This, to me, is actually going to be really interesting. And we'll be speaking with Brian Deese, the White House uh, economic advisor, in about an hour and 15 minutes. 
minutes. But John, to me, there's a question about how sustainable this move can be and what this ignites overseas with European allies if so much of the jobs that we're looking for that are critical to the supply chain are really being encouraged to move to the US. I'm thinking more about China as well. Tim Cook's on that trip, right, of Apple. That's going to be interesting. How much can they actually move away from China, given their dependence not only on the supply side, but also the demand side? Jay Farley joins us now. I'm pleased to say to kick off our coverage this morning, the head of FX strategy at Rabobank out of London. Jane, can I start with the question that I posed to Tom moments ago? Is this US economy picking up or slowing down? You know, I think the only thing that we can be sure about is that this is going to be a really choppy ride. And and I think there are different dynamics in, in this uh, particularly slowdown, shall we say, uh, than, than in, in other years. And that is because, of course, the labour market dynamics. And you've already spoken about it. You know, if we look at the OECD data, almost every single country in the OECD have got uh, uh, labour market shortages. Um, and this is in part a demographic issue. You know, if, if we look, for instance, um, at the UK, um, already almost uh, uh, 20%. 20% of us are over the age of 65. That dynamic will be there in, in the US in 2030. There's going to be a shortage of, of, of labour. And when we talk about right. the onshoring that you've been mentioning, if we talk about our critical industries in, in perhaps pharmaceutical or um, in, in in food, energy, the, these sorts of things, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to onshore w- without coming across these labour market shortages. And that means that it's very likely that inflation is going to be persistent on the core level for for some time, and, and right. therefore you've got this 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 issue of of fed, fed interest rates, irrespective of of whether or not the, the right. peak is five percent or five and a quarter, but probably staying at that level for some time. And then, given that the equity market has rallied for two months, it's going to be sensitive to to, to that sort of information that leads it to assume that Fed rates could be higher for longer. Jane, OECD out with their report, it's always an interesting report, but ever more interesting now. 18 of 38 OECD countries are enjoying double-digit inflation. How does your world change or adapt to that? Do you become more dollar-centric in your analysis? Are there certain currency pairs you look at when we have this amazingly persistent inflation? Well, uh, you know, persistent inflation that we can talk about OECD and we can talk about labour market shortages across the board. But I think Europe is is where it, inflation really is quite dangerous. And this is because at the moment, you know, we've seen the euro rallying. We've seen a lot of relief. Uh, you know, energy or gas storage units are, are pretty full, even though we've begun to go into this, this cold snap, snap now. And people are optimistic about we get through this winter and, and the eurozone economy is going to be OK. We don't have that view because, you know, it, particularly if you have a China reopening, say, next spring or, or next summer, there's going to be a lot more competition for that LNG, for that gas, for the, for, 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 for Europe trying to, to fill up its gas storage units for winter 2023 without using supplies from, from Russia. That's going to be really quite difficult. And, and we think actually winter 2023, it's going to be pretty tough for, um, for, for Europe. So actually, um, if we're looking at um, other currency pairs, you know, for instance, I would look at the, the Aussie rather than outperforming the euro going into, say, a six-month or a 12-month view, because I think uh, Europe is going to be really very um, sensitive to persistent inflation over the medium term. And certainly uh, Australia is getting a bit of a boost today after the 25 basis point rate hike overnight by the central bank there. Just want to build on what you're talking about with Europe. There was a story in the Financial Times today talking about the reliance of uh, particularly Germany and German manufacturing on Russia for natural gas. If some of the worst case scenarios come to pass with respect to a cold winter and not uh, having some sort of additional LNG supplier, Where do you see that taking the euro in and of itself with Germany's main industry flat on its back? Well, again, it very much depends on what happens going into winter 2023. We'll hear a lot more about that, I think, in the summer of next year. But to be honest, I, I think there's a risk still that we could see below parity again in that sort of time horizon, because I think the markets had this respite for Europe. You know, we, we've had a warmer period. We know that the gas storage units are full for now. The market is optimistic. Oh, yeah, we'll get through this winter and things will look fine. But actually, winter 2023 is looming out there. It's a concern. We have a lot of uh, 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 commentary 
you already about the deindustrialization of, of of Germany, which is a very frightening thought. And and perhaps you might not want to use that term because it is so frightening. But you can certainly look at Germany's business model, and and you can see uh, big uh, chemical manufacturers, uh, pulp manufacturers, paper manufacturers, glass manufacturers, all having uh, moved or curtailed uh, operations in 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 Germany already. And that's not just by looking at this winter. That's because they're looking ahead to what might be for the next couple of winters too. So uh, I, I think Europe is, is still in a very dangerous position, even though um, the outlook for now appears to have brightened. Jane, do you think we've underplayed, when it comes to the dollar trade, underplayed how important the other side of the currency pair has been through 2022? I'm thinking about Europe and the energy crisis. I look at sterling and the policy issues. I look at China and COVID zero. You can really take your pick, Jane. I wonder if we're still underplaying that going into 23. I think quite likely because, you know, that there's two parts of the dollar trade and, and the first is the interest rate differential and, and, the, and the focus on the Fed and peak inflation, etc. But the other is is a lot of the, the, the geopolitical political effects, the, the safe haven demand for, for the US dollar. And, and if we do have you know, real concerns uh, next next summer, so you know, China's reopening, big demand for LNG, LNG prices going up, uh, Europe really facing another difficult winter in, in, in 2023, um, yeah, th- th- there's going to be the market thinking, well, you know what, maybe the dollar is a better trade because of safe haven. And, and, and that is something which could mean, again, certainly that we're going to have a very choppy uh, picture of, of this peak dollar, but it could be quite a lengthy uh, period of, of peak dollar, you know, as this choppiness really plays out perhaps for some months. Hey, Jane, this was great. Jane Foley out of London over at Rampa Bank on the US dollar and foreign exchange. Lisa, I think this is really important stuff. When it comes to the dollar, we focused a lot on this massive rate hiking cycle of this Federal Reserve through 2022, but it's the other side of the currency pair that's really dominated things, whether it's sterling and the policy issues of the last couple of months, whether it's Europe, the energy crisis, China and COVID zero, the BOJ and burying its head in the sand as everybody hikes interest rates. There's a lot going on outside of the US dollar. But everybody basically makes the narrative that the US is just doing so well. So therefore, it's because of potential Federal Reserve uh, hikes, which also is part of the story. You raise a great point, though. And if we do get that chop that Jane was just talking about, what does that do to some of the leverage that's put on with interest rate swaps and other issues? This is something that Bank of International Settlements has been looking 11 at. 11 minutes into the show, and we've not mentioned the World Cup, Tom. Right now, well, we had Jane minutes. Foley on Rabobank, a great Dutch bank. Can Nederlande, Argentina, Verslan. Mm, translate that. Can, can, can Virgil van Dijk be, <laughs> can, can Virgil van Dijk beat Messi? Just gonna can say the no. Netherlands take on Argentina? <laughs> what a head-to-head that's going to be, Tom. I mean, those are two <laughs> physical teams. Week. They're like... Not just the Brazilians. They're not this. They're not that. Did, did you watch Brazil yesterday? I enjoyed it. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. I, it's like it, it's forty-five minutes of just. Do they play that way in the Premier League football. with all the footsie footsie fancy ball oh thing? Do they do that? The individual players. Yeah. Have you seen Anthony over at Manchester United? No, I'm not. You know, help okay. me. He, he's trying to. He's trying. And I think you see you see Vinny do that at Real, and okay. Neymar do that at PSG. Okay. Well, it's good. Scotty Moore is today with us today, or is she on life support? No idea. Spain a little bit later this morning, Morocco, Morocco. 10 a.m. Eastern time. That's after the, the Open on Bloomberg TV. <laughs> coming up a little bit later, Amy Wu Silverman of RBC coming up in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, a COVID outbreak that began last month appears to be tailing off. The nation reported a little more than 276,000 new cases on Monday. Infections have fallen each of the last eight days. At the same time, there's been a pullback in the sweeping testing regime in major cities. Officials are seeking a more targeted method. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. and the European Union are considering new tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. It would be part of a bid to fight carbon emissions and global overcapacity. It's a novel approach. The U.S. and the EU would use tariffs usually employed in trade disputes to advance their climate agenda. President Biden is likely to announce that he's running for re-election after the Christmas and New Year's holiday. That's according to White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. The president turned 80 last month and is already the oldest person ever to occupy the Oval Office. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
I'm glad we're dancing tonight, but don't dance too much. Don't spike the football before we get it into the end zone. We are going to win. A vote for me is a vote for Georgia values. And it also, it also is going to give you a voice in Washington because you hadn't had it yet. Another runoff in Georgia. Amazing how consequential this was, Tom. What, 18, 19, 20 months ago and, and now less so. Now less so down in Georgia over the next 24 hours. We're here. It's alone. It's a complete focus today for all of political Washington. And, John, I would go back 40 or 50 years to the giant John McPhee who changed nonfiction writing in America. It wasn't his first book, Writing Off for the New Yorker, but it had a lot to do when he wrote an essay on Georgia from south to north. And particularly a foreigner like me up in the north or a foreigner like Joe Matthew, you say, do we really know Georgia? And I think Georgia's hugely misunderstood. We'll pick up on this story in just a moment. Just want to get you up to speed on the price action if you are just tuning in this Tuesday morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures are just slightly lower, negative by just 0.05%. No real drama here. The drama was yesterday. Great data in America. Again, an upside surprise, and that drove equities lower and yields much higher, specifically at the front end of the yield curve. So the two-year blasting gout. And a 10-year, still around 356. So you've got that curve inversion, Tom, just yeah. deeper, deeper curve inversion. Negative 80-something basis points at a close yesterday and levels we haven't seen since the early 1980s. Ian Lingen publishes a possibility of a negative 100 basis point Over at BMO, inversion. 100. Like Volcker level. Wow. That's a wild, wild statistic as well. He's truly a, a pro at it. Let's dive into the political moment in the state of Georgia. We can do that with someone steeped in the warfare of Massachusetts politics. Joseph Matthew joins us this morning in Atlanta trying to take Atlanta Braves players back over to the Boston at Red Sox. Joe, I, I look at this, and I'm going to go to Jason Koo in the New York Times with some great graphics of how volatile Georgia has been. And the heart and soul of it is the northern suburbs of Atlanta, their vacillation this way and that. Before this election, one day before the election, those key 80-some precincts, how are they vacillating? Well, we're, we're just about to find out here. It does appear that they are vacillating towards the incumbent, Senator Raphael Warnock, who I will remind you won the election just a month ago. 37,000 vote victory, but they didn't get to 50%, so that's why we're doing this runoff. But as he says, he has now run for this job five times. He's won it four times. And he's going up for another one here. But your point is correct. This race will likely be decided in the Atlanta suburbs. This is really, we're drilling down here to 200,000 voters. That's it. Who split the ticket one month ago, voted for Brian Kemp, but did not vote for Herschel Walker, right. the Republican. Those are the voters who are going to decide whether Raphael Warnock stays in Washington or Herschel Walker becomes the next senator uh, from Georgia here. And he's feeling pretty good. I was with Warnock at that rally last night. We just heard from Jeezy was the entertainment. People were really feeling it. It was pouring rain. And that's what I'm going to point you guys to. You should normally be able to see Peach Tree Street behind me here as I broadcast from the Bloomberg Bureau in Atlanta. But guys, it's pouring rain. There is so much fog, you can't see the tops of the buildings. And if this race does come down to turnout, as we do believe, Right. The weather could be the biggest story today. What is the early voting? Is it a factor here like it is for the first two of any given November? It's a massive factor. They set a record. About two million people voted early in this race. We know, based on the areas they came from, that they're from democratically friendly strongholds. We know that a lot of black voters voted early this time. And so Herschel Walker's been taking his bus up around the northern reaches of Georgia into the rural areas to try to pick off white, independent, and Republican voters he thinks might be able to make the difference in this race. This has a lot less to do with the individuals in some cases as it does the party message. You want somebody to vote with Joe Biden or Mitch McConnell? There's your choice. And Joe, talking of that, what is the importance of 51 votes for the Democrats in the Senate versus just 50-50? How much more, mm -hmm. what policies could they potentially go after that they couldn't with just an even split? Well, it gives them controls of the committees, and that, that's really what we're talking about here. Instead of having uh, to force a power-sharing agreement with Republicans, that gives them control of the committees. And remember, we're talking about the Senate. This is where judges are confirmed. This is where nominations are sent by the administration, right? When, when Joe Biden goes to fill out the rest of his cabinet next year, when I'm assuming we get some departures, it's the Senate that's going to deal with that. Incredibly important here as we see 
likely Kevin McCarthy take the gavel with a Republican majority in the House in a couple of weeks. Emory Horton joins us as well, our chief Washington uh, correspondent, and uh, we're thrilled she could be with us today uh, in, in, in Washington. Emory, what is the best outcome here for the president? I, I mean, obviously, it's a Warnock uh, effort. There's no question about that. But there's got to be a body language to it. What is the best outcome? That is the best outcome. And I think, as Joe really outlined, this obviously isn't a need to have for the Democrats, but it's certainly a nice to have when it comes to having that advance uh, ability on committees to be able to make sure that they're getting their uh, pr uh, individuals and candidates through. But also the fact that you have to look at 2024, which we heard from Ron Klain last night, that he expects the president to make an announcement. That announcement is to run following the holidays. He's obviously going to be talking with his family, as he did in Nantucket over Thanksgiving. But 2024, the Republicans have to defend 10 seats. The Democrats have to defend 23 seats. It'll be really crucial to have this Georgia seat for six years if they're able to grab it this term. Emory, you mentioned Ron Klain, uh, the White House chief of staff, talking about Joe Biden probably announcing his likely run after the holidays. Is there any pushback? Is it mounting for him to anoint a sort of successor within the Democratic Party, given where he is in the polls, given where he is in his career? Well, listen, coming off the midterm elections, Biden definitely has a boost within his own party with the fact that everyone said this was going to be a red wave. It was not. They even picked up a seat. Potentially, they're going to end up picking up another seat in Georgia. And they lost the House, but it was very, very slim. So this really keeps Republicans in check in terms of what Biden wants to do. There's obviously they're going to have to work in a bipartisan way, but this was most certainly the better outcome that many were predicted for the president, which is why also he feels like he has this momentum to be able to run. Also, former President Donald Trump already made his announcement. And Biden said he got into this race originally because he thought he was the only person who could beat Trump. And likely he will continue that mantra going into 2024. But yes, obviously, people in the Democratic Party are thinking this he was already the oldest U.S. president. He recently turned 80 just a few weekends ago. Um, so they are obviously thinking about where is the bench? Who is going to be next to lead this party into the future? AMH, down in Washington. Anne Marie, thank you. Let's pick up on those comments from Ron Klein, Tom, speaking to the Wall Street Journal CEO Council. I expect the decision will be to do it. This is basically a pre announcement of the announcement, isn't it? It's, uh, it certainly looks and not like a shocker to, to a lot of people. I, I think this was widely anticipated. I, still, when Henry Horton says the word 80, I don't care who it is. I'm in shock. Why are we, why are we, where, how did we get here? I guess is my answer. And frankly, I thought the way Speaker Pelosi stepped aside was with some grace and, and the gentleman from Maryland, Steny Hoyer, did the same thing. And, you know, there was a constructive ballet in the House, but it, it's a, when did we become a gerontocracy? You asked the question, can you help us answer it? No. What's your I, take on it? I just don't know. I honestly, you know, I'd, I'd lean on experts here, Michael Beschloss and others, but I just don't have an answer for the shock of hearing Anne-Marie Horton use the 80 word. It's consistency right now. How much is this really just a moment where he's trying to keep consistency so he can get some agenda through before they figure out what to do? Because if he announced yeah, that's now, fair. two that's years fair. out... I'm not going to run again. How much does that torpedo his agenda and his leadership? It, 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 what's the equivalent of Britain? This is a nostalgia back to another generation. Well, we, don't, we don't have one. We have a very you young prime I mean, minister. Even Tony Blair right and now. Gordon Brown are not on the edge. Of, John Major? Is what? it like if Major? Right now, they're right. Yeah, sure. They're no, nowhere near that right now. They're nowhere near that right now. But John Major maybe approaches that. Do we need John Major to come back and run? I don't know if anyone wants that, even at the Conservative Party. But that's the equivalent the here. Where we, I know, think we're underplaying this. This president seriously believes that if Donald Trump is the candidate for the Republican Party, yeah. that he can beat him. Bottom line, he seriously believes that. Yes, I think. I Based think, on the way he communicates, he truly, seriously believes that. I, yeah, I think so. I, I, I can't disagree. Coming up, Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity on this equity market. It's the bear market Great rally over. Tony's up next.
Tuesday morning. Good morning to you. Equities going absolutely nowhere on the S&P 500. A break after the chaos of yesterday, if you want to call it chaos. That's what Bramo called it this morning when she walked in the studio. Tom, chaos. Shocked. And please, she took the day off. Just was shocked she went that angle. <laughs> Futures unchanged on the S&P on the Nasdaq up about a tenth of 1%. Big day of losses yesterday. Biggest one-day loss in about a month off the back of stronger-than-expected data in America. Economic <clears> output picking up, if you're looking at the ISM. Services indicator. That meant two-year <laughs> yields were picking up as well. Here's a snapshot of the bond market. Two 10s and 30s, your two-year back to 436.64. Yields coming in a couple of basis points this morning on a two-year. On a 10-year, we're at 356.98. So we unwind some of that curve inversion, the curve just a little bit steeper, but still negative, Tom. Almost 80 basis points this morning. Number one guy right on oil, Ed Morse, will join us later, John. Just moments ago, oil dropping down again, right up, about to stop on 75 handle. On oil, the low was November 28th, $73.60. To break down from there, I, you know, we don't do chart opinions here, but I will simply state the chart is inelegant, to say the least. I love that you say we don't do chart opinions. We don't do chart. I'm not going to get into you follow up with a chart opinion. Analysis, I'll say this I, about crude, Tom. It's interesting to see this <clears throat> pullback in crude at yeah. a time that we're seeing evidence every single day that slowly and incrementally China is making a shift away from COVID zero. Yep. Now I say specifically, slowly and incrementally, because we have to look at the policy that we're seeing and the policy changes that are adapting day to day, week by week, and not anticipate this full reopening that may or may not materialize. Yep. The ultimate move that we've seen this week, I think, is the back away, Tom, from testing requirements. We saw that in Shanghai in the last couple of days. We're seeing it from Beijing this morning, just backing away slowly from testing requirements across major cities. That'll be the new slow, but there's others, and one is the diesel price is clearing up in the Northeast. I mean, I, I saw a number of blurbs over the last 24 hours, which is where you get to a lower gallon of gas, a lower gallon of diesel, et cetera. Lisa's been super focused on that over the last yeah. several weeks. In fact, Lisa, you were worried about it at one point. You still worried now? Yeah, I am. I actually am very worried because the price action, you can come up with a narrative that makes sense, but we're seeing ships, tankers being backed up over in Turkey, trying mm. to figure out this whole Russian gas cap, price cap, and, and what's going to happen with that. It's unclear to me. The narrative makes sense. The price action, less yeah. so. Is there a narrative? It's out crude? there. No, I think On in the general. Pullback? Tony Dwyer is chief and narrative strategist. At is that Richard what his Moody. title is? That's what his, his title official is. title. He has been, seriously, folks, Anthony Dwyer has been a confirmed bull for years, wrapped around his singular call, which is if you don't have a recession, it's tough to go down. When the facts change, Mr. Dwyer changes, and he joins us with a short, taut outlook for next year. Tony, your, your outlook for next year is very undwire. Discuss. <laughs> well, it was for this year too, Tom. You know, um, it, listen, this is, we, we come up with great formulas and awesome, awesome quant programs and big words, but ultimately what it comes down to is you, you need money to buy things, do things, or invest in things. And the issue that we've had since last spring was when the Fed is tightening to the degree they are, it's restricting the amount of money that's out there. And yes, we were given a ridiculous amount of money during the pan just after the pandemic but i don't know about your household my household spends it so i need new money to spend more money right and that availability has just been dropping well i look at this tony and you've got a turn in the year i've never seen so many outlooks gaming out turns to a week or a day or an hour how do you prosecute owning equities if the, the turn in the summer of 2023 is so opaque? How do you, you, you don't find a moment to jump into the market. How do you get into the market if you're more optimistic later on? Well, this, despite being so cautious this year, there were two opportunities to have some pretty significant rallies. There was a summer rally, which came out of an extreme oversold condition and, and a bit too much pessimism. And then the same thing happened after what we called the fall fall, where you got this year-end rally. And remember, the year-end rally, there's a lot of historical precedent out there. Anytime that you've been up uh, or down through the first three quarters of the year, more than 20%, other than the great financial crisis, which I don't think we're in, each time you've been up a range between 8 to 12 percent. So we met that. So really, Tom, what it comes down to is every rally 
starts with an extreme oversold condition, every real intermediate term rally. And that's what we're expecting once we go back to the lows next year. It'll start as an extreme oversold rally, and it'll hopefully be kickstarted by a Fed that is not just taking their foot off the throat of the market, but is actually adding some air. Tony, I love this. Basically, the market is so convinced that the market's going to be down for the first half and up for the second half that they're just remaining all invested now and are going to ride the ship, which isn't going to lead to that sort of downturn in the first half. I mean, what's going to be the trigger? Some people talking about earnings coming out softer, yet what we've seen from companies isn't yet that. Right. And that's it. Like, guys, it was four months ago that things are great. Used car prices. Everything is great. And now there just, Lisa, hadn't been enough time for the Fed's actions to really enter into economic output. And that that's so now we're starting to get it. The ISM's below 50. The household employment data is weak. You're starting to get the idea that bad news can become bad news. Up until now, we've been in the temporary sweet spot. It's what really caused the, the narrative um, for the for the year-end rally. You've been at a point where the Fed hiked rates quick enough that it slowed goods inflation. So we went from the pandemic, where I don't know about you guys, but in my household, you know, Santa comes every day. Um, it's on the front stoop. You you know, so we went from buying stuff to doing stuff. So the goods inflation has come down because of the transition of that plus the Fed. But when you look at the services inflation, Jerome Powell was very clear. And it was also evident in the pay payroll data last week. There's labor inflation and that's likely not going to peak until at some point next year. So the sweet spot that had driven the rally was inflation's off peak. But the problem is it, it and it you're not yet at the point where you have a recession. And that point, Lisa, to make a long-winded answer or even longer, is when you get those earnings declines next year with an economic recession. So basically, John, what I just heard is that we're going to hear Tony go home to his children and say, Santa Claus isn't coming today. It sounds like Tony's unhappy with yeah. the amount of time for <laughs> exactly. Santa has to visit <laughs> I'm already getting heat show up too. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting heat already on Twitter for calling him a bull. The answer is Dwyer has been in this market and participated in this market, John and Lisa, forever when everybody else was scared stiff. Well, and he's not alone. And this is really sort of the key question, and that's what you both are getting at, which is when do you get out and then when do you get back in or do you just stay in? And does that actually prevent the market from going down? There was a study from Goldman Sachs showing that uh, big investors have about $5 trillion hinging on a soft landing, even as more and more analysts say a soft landing is not in the picture anymore. Do you think that those are going to get, uh, those are positions that are going to get slammed out? Positions in, for example, cyclical companies, positions, for example, yeah. that there's going to be some sort of softening in the rate cutting cycle much sooner? Every, at least everybody's jumping on the industrials. The time to do that was earlier this year when they were, the industrials, it's funny. If you look at a chart, I know time doesn't use charts, but if you look at a chart on the industrials, they seem to peak just before recession starts each cycle. So this is what's happening is typically what happens. And then the idea that we're going to have a soft landing, everybody has their favorite yield curve that even Fed governors use different yield curves. Let's use all the yield curves. Let's any yield curve that exists between three months and 30 years and take the whole breadth of them. 84% of them were inverted. You've had a recession every single time when it's more than 55%. It's at 84%. The Philly Fed State um, Coincident Index, anytime it's hit th this level, you've had a recession. The leading economic indicators being a minus 2.7, anytime you've any been anywhere near this level, you've been in a recession or coming to one. So the idea that we're going to have a soft landing means that so many, so much of the data, as much as I would love that, so much of the data would be historically unique. Right. And, and that just to finish it, it would be historically unique if we do go into a recession to have already made the low. What sectors do you hide in, given the Dwyer gloom? <laughs> You know, I can't wait to not be gloomy. It's against my nature. But I would say the defensives, Tom, um, you know, we're up the better part of 12 percent. Remember, the range of outcomes for the year end rally was eight to 12 percent. So I, I would shift into it's what our note said yesterday to the more defensive exit the year on a more defensive posture, which means staples, health care, um, non-energy use. What's your base case, Tony, with respect to the reopening of China and whether that means it's a good opportunity to invest there? 
I really, at least I, I, you know, I have such a hard time with that because it's been fits and starts. Is it a great idea? Yeah, they, we've seen this incredible surge in some of the Chinese based stocks, but I don't want to pretend I'm a great global strategist. All I know is that when you have a global monetary system, ex China, tightening interest rates and restricting the supply of money and real liquidity, it's very hard to grow because you need money to do that. It's only one of the best. And one of the few that would admit to that, Tom. I don't want to pretend to be a. Oh, yeah. I don't want to yeah, so pretend to be a global no, in, strategist. Tony Twyther, of Canaccord Generity. Yeah, Thank Lisa, you, Tony. You, you missed this yesterday, Lisa. We had a guy come in with a 55-page outlook. It's beautiful, all fancy artwork and that. Dwyer's writing off the back of a bar napkin. I mean, he's writing like a three-page note. It's right to the point, which is what people want. You can read the thing, you can digest it, John, in 45 seconds, and that's it. And there's a place for that on Wall Street. At Tony's point and the unknown around China, I think he's right. When you speak to people on the ground in China, you've got questionable efficacy of the vaccine, questionable coverage of vaccinations in the country. And therefore, Tom, you've got to ask the, the question, if you're going to reopen in uh, China, I, what kind of reopening I, are we going to have? And we've got to remember the kind of reopenings that we had in the West, in the United States, in Europe. It was very stop-start. Very stop start. Yes. And I wonder if our past is in their future with regards to that I... and just how clean this so called reopening will be, how smooth that runway is going to be, gonna Lisa. Well, I don't think you can. Companies have to try because they have to decide whether or not to build out some of their capacity. We've heard about Tesla, for example, moving some of the production away from Shanghai because of some of these concerns. So this is actually a really important question for companies on the ground. It's not just a theoretical one for investors, but I take your point that it's very hard to get a clear line from here to there with respect to a reopening. Can we set up the rest of this morning? Mr. Solomon at Goldman Sachs coming up with uh, Shanali Basak in the next couple of hours. That's going to be an interesting conversation, Tom. What's happened to the battle for talent on Wall Street? I, Where are we with the, the bonus pool for the likes it, of Goldman is, Sachs? Is she taking the entire eight-hour with him? I mean, there's enough to talk about. I think it's going to be a solid 15-minute interview, TK. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's, enough, there's enough to talk about, and we can talk about the reporting by Bloomberg and others, uh, Sri Natarajan and others, on a dearth of bonuses for mere mortals at some of these firms and um, also frankly uh, you've got to ask them about what is perceived whether right or wrong which is their failed consumer bank Are that's calling a that failure is that what you're calling it i'm because saying that i don't know if miss bassett can say that right in the heat of the interview I'm not sure she'll, Mr. Solomon she'll be either. more delicate than i will sure, analysts wouldn't necessarily jump to that conclusion yet either the goldman ceo out. coming up in one hour and yeah. 20 minutes Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Voters in Georgia will decide today what the U.S. Senate will look like for the next two years. In a runoff election, they'll choose between Senator Raphael Warnock, a Democrat, or Republican Herschel Walker. Democrats already hold the majority, but a victory would give Warnock, would give them a 51st vote, which would make legislating slightly easier. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. has proposed selling Taiwan as many as 100 of its most advanced Patriot anti-aircraft missiles. That deal, along with radar and support equipment, is valued at $882 million. It's a move that would only add tensions between the U.S. and China. The Biden administration is concerned that Beijing is becoming more aggressive toward Taiwan. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission is investigating several crypto firms over allegations their advertisements were deceptive or misleading. The agency enforces laws that require truth in advertising. They include rules that individuals disclose when they have been paid for endorsements or reviews. The FTC isn't releasing any details. PepsiCo reportedly laying off hundreds of workers at the headquarters of its North American Snacks and Beverage Division. According to the Wall Street Journal, the company has told employees the job cuts will let the company operate more efficiently. PepsiCo employs, employs about 309,000 people worldwide. And Intel says it's on track to regain leadership in making semiconductors. If the plan from CEO Pat Gelsinger succeeds, Intel would reverse market share losses to rivals such as advanced micro devices and NVIDIA. The company says it is relying more on equipment vendors for help rather than trying to do all the work itself. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
we are likely to uh, to see the euro area in a technical recession. I suspect that Q4 uh, this year, the one that, that we're in now, we'll see a very slightly negative um, GDP number, uh, and we're likely to see that uh, for Q1 next year. On the other hand, my expectation is we're not going to see 2023 as a year of uh, recession. Fantastic to catch up with the Irish Central Bank Governor, who's basically acknowledging they're going to be hiking interest rates on December 15th and doing so into what he anticipates will be yeah. a technical recession. That's the direction of travel at the ECB, Tom. We sometimes do these interviews and we're like, oh, OK, well, you know, we have an important official like that. And from his experience in New Zealand, great. But, you know, I started out with the big and broad and you went ECB narrow and we covered a lot of ground in that interview. Should we get Fed narrow right now? The latest from City, Tom. Yeah. A slowdown to a 50 basis point hike in December remains very likely, but we should expect Fed officials to guide towards higher terminal rates and we maintain our call for another 50 basis point hike in February at a terminal range of 525 to 550. And here's the final line, with asymmetric upside risk. Yeah. That's the bottom line for yep. the team at City. And that is the key determinant. And let us be clear here at the end of the year in celebration that Andrew, can we all agree Andrew Hollenhorst and his team? Yeah, phenomenal. Way out front. I would say this. City and Bank of America, yeah. I think, laughed at in spring of this year yeah. when they started to talk about <clears> how far right. this Fed might push it. It's turned out to be yeah. the right call. My, my, my basic take is Deutsche Bank had the recession call way early and Hollenhorst had the interest rate vector. Just absolutely. Agreed. Uh, now, we got an update now. Mr. Hollenhorst of UCLA joins the chief U.S. economist at Citigroup. Andrew, I'm going to cut to the chase. The fancy math, the ratio math of the Bloomberg Financial uh, Conditions Index is not good for Powell, goes against your thesis as well. We are accommodative. It's in research notes this morning. Ben Laidler over at eToro notes it off the Chicago Financial Conditions series as well. How much are those measurements going against the chairman of the Fed? I think you're right, Tom. It's going in the wrong direction, the wrong direction from what Chair Powell would like to see. I watch those conditions every morning, just like you, just like the viewers. And every morning I'm thinking, what is Chair Powell thinking when he sees this? I think that's true today. I think that was true after his comments at the Brookings Institution a week ago, uh, where I think he was trying to send a hawkish message or a neutral message, and the market took it as dovish. Right. So it's just all more hawkish risk down the line. If we extend the x-axis out, let's say we do that, and we do move to a higher nominal rate, even more advanced real rates as well, does that give our economy time to get used to a new higher rate regime? I, I think the idea with slowing down is it gives the Fed a chance to really evaluate in real time what has been the effect of raising interest rates, of tightening financial conditions. We see that in the housing sector. We see a housing sector that's going in reverse, house prices that are coming down. That's where interest rate policy is very potent and very effective. The issue that this Fed is facing is we have a really tight labor market and they're trying to loosen that labor market with a really blunt tool, which is interest rate policy. Not clear that that's moved far enough yet to see that loosening. Andrew, what are we missing? We keep thinking that there's going to be a much more sustained downturn, and yet the data keeps surprising. John was asking earlier, is this economy speeding up or slowing down? We can't tell based on some of the recent data. So what explains these surprises that we keep getting? So you've seen some areas of the economy slow down. We were talking about housing, which is going in reverse. Good spending in general has been a lot weaker, but really strong services spending. And when we keep seeing that spending data that's coming in strong, we think back to all of the savings that built up over the last couple of years. That's coming down now. The savings rate is historically low, but it looks like there may be even more of that excess savings to work through. You look at credit card balances, which are rising. That can't continue forever. But remember, consumers were very under levered coming into this year. And there's a lot of room to grow credit on consumer balance sheets. So that process is underway. All of that is stoking continued demand. And as long as that demand is out there, you're going to see firms that at the very least want to hold on to their existing workers. These were hard workers to hire. It's been a tight labor market. So again, very, very hard to, to loosen that labor market.
Andrew, we're hearing about white-collar workers that are getting laid off first, exactly to your point, that the rank and file that actually make things go on a tangible level are needed and necessary. How much do you think that a soft landing is pretty much off the table, despite the fact that so many people are basically betting on that being the outcome? I, I think we just need to be really clear on this, Lisa, and, and it is an unfortunate reality to have to acknowledge but the likelihood of a soft landing is quite low. Yes, it's possible. Yes, there's a hopeful scenario where you can get a soft landing and everybody would like to see that. But we need to be realistic. The balance of the historical evidence, as well as the fact that inflation is just running so high and it's so difficult to bring down inflation from these levels. I think if you acknowledge those facts and you acknowledge that we really do have a wage price spiral here, I know that it's very unpopular to say that, but there's no question wages are rising, prices are rising, there's an expectation that they continue to rise. It's a self-reinforcing dynamic that is likely going to take a recession to bring those inflationary forces back down. At what point is a financial accident going to be the trigger to some sort of more rapid decline rather than just sort of waiting for Godot, which is what a lot of people seem to be doing, and then confirming their experience or their expectation rather for some sort of downturn in specific data? I think that's where you kind of balance what's going on in financial markets and what's going on in the real economy. So like we were talking about, financial conditions tighten very aggressively, have now loosened from those tighter levels. And we've seen the economy slow down in sectors, but we haven't seen this broad slowing that's cooled demand and brought inflation down. So it, it could be the case that financial conditions just continue to tighten further, need to continue to tighten further from here. Then the risk that there's a more significant breakdown in the financial sector becomes higher. Uh, I would say that looking at the world today, looking at the US in particular today, pretty clean consumer balance sheets, mm -hmm. banks that are not over levered as well. All of that makes us feel more comfortable about the ability right. of the economy to withstand higher interest rates, but certainly those risks rise as you continue to fight tighten but, financial but conditions. But Andrew, what, what drives me nuts here, and maybe it's my fosseldom is, well, did you see what Senator Cassidy said to me yesterday? Do you want we're to repeat gonna, that for people who missed it? We, I think we, I think we'll get <laughs> to that. Because I'm not saying we'll get it. To this in a minute. He's like, I'm Did on a weight loss program. Twitter, yes, <laughs> I go home, vet bill screaming at me on the Cassidy, the Cassidy diet. We'll talk about that in a minute. Andrew, older people like me know that we somehow survived a 5% terminal rate. The youth of America, including you, think we're all going to die. Come <laughs> on. Can't we survive where we're going to with the Citigroup call? Well, there's a really important concept, which I know we talk about all the time, but it's important to emphasize, which is the real interest rate, the nominal interest rate minus inflation. And that's really what I think Fed officials are focusing on more here. And we just saw in the wage data, wage growth that's 5% plus. We've known for some time in the price inflation data, price inflation is 5% plus. So when you look at that 5% interest rate, and you're noting at the top, we were saying 5% policy rates, 5.5% policy rates with upside risk to that. That's because just getting to 5% would get that real rate just back to zero. So if you think that real interest rates need to move positive, then the Fed would need to move potentially beyond that level. Um, and to your point, Tom, in an economy that's running high inflation, 5% plus interest rates should not be surprising. Andrew, thanks for being with us. Great call really? this year. No okay. doubt we'll Cheers. talk before year end. Andrew Hollenhorst there of City. I thought it was unprofessional that the doctor shared his evaluation so publicly with our audience yesterday. I That's think he should have saved Cassidy. that comment for private, you know, just straight no. up telling TK to lose some pounds. We're on, we're on the set brutal. here. I'm trying to, brutal. I'm asking him about, context? I'm asking him about vitamins for seniors and he goes, well, I don't know anything about vitamins, but you need to lose some weight. <laughs> Well, <laughs> oh, have you got something to add? No, I have nothing oh, no. to add. Okay. No, I just, so, you, know, you know, sorry, I missed it. We, we've done a full-time thing. We threw I'm all sorry, the tang out. It. We're back to tang zero full-time. Is that right? Yeah. Is that how you're cutting back? That's how I'm cutting back, tang zero. Ahead of the holidays. Can we get to this? Another one. This is from Unicredit. This is going to sound quite familiar to many of you, I'm sure. Ongoing sharp monetary tightening and upcoming recession pose significant downside risks. However, evidence of slowing core inflation, peaking official rates and signs of economic recovery should pave the way for more risk-taking in the second half of 23. <laughs> now, that's not a dig at Unicredit. That's on Europe, by the way, and not just the United States. Uh, Eric, Tom, we're hearing that fabulous. from pretty much every single bank on the street, that I... the second half of 23 is going to be a better place to be. For equity markets yeah, and risk taking. This is a joke. It's like a double pivot, triple pivot. I've never. I've Sounds never like gymnastics, seen it like TK. This. Yeah, well said. 
That, that was just that was well said. Thank you. We're that a good team well sometimes. Should, well, sometimes. You know, sometimes. You know. sometimes. Can, can I note something I learned yesterday? What did you learn? Morocco and Spain are nine miles apart. Is that what the you English learned yesterday? Channel, you swam the English Channel once. I did, yeah. Ride, yeah. And it was like 18 miles or, or something. No, I, I think no I swam idea. a couple of meters out. <laughs> this game today, they're like wicked close. There's that Gibraltar You're watching Rock that game. and, you know. You're watching that game. Oh, yeah. That Gibraltar Rock is ours, by the way. Oh, it is. I didn't know that. <laughs> From New York, this is Bloomberg. This excess savings conversation, from our perspective, is starting to run out. The rocket fuel for consumer spending is coming in in a <clears throat> dramatically slower fashion going forward. To say that we've already drawn it down, we're headed into a liquidity crisis, I think is a little bit premature. We're going to have to see growth weaker for central banks to hit their targets, and that's not yet reflected in earnings. We've got shoes to drop that we have to wait for in 2023. It's too early. We haven't seen the capitulation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Bravitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures basically unchanged on the S&P 500. TK, I've been saying it's a snooze this week into next week, at least the schedule yeah. is anyway. Next week is all about CPI and the Federal Reserve. This week, more decent data out of America. Friday payrolls, yesterday the ISM. That drove equities lower and yields higher. Yeah, I started Monday, John, feeling it was not going to be a snooze fest this week. And I think we see that in a lot of cross currents going on. And one of them is this continued resilient. And you mentioned it earlier. Let's give credit to Neil Dutta, among others at Renaissance, who have just said, wait a minute, these are the facts. And the facts is even Andrew Hollenhorst said the reality is there's a resiliency there. Well, let's pair that with Andrew Hollenhorst to City <clears throat> and what we heard from him just moments ago on this program. And if you're just tuning in, this is basically what he had to say. Lisa, upside risk to the terminal rate for this Federal Reserve in 23. He's not alone. There are a lot of economists that still say that, especially with the recent data. The market's not buying it. The market seems to be downplaying a lot of the expectations for some of the peak interest rates uh, that we might have seen perhaps just a couple of weeks ago. So what's going to be the trigger to really be the gut check where they start to rethink that? Second half of 2023. Things are just going to be great. They're going to be awesome. That's the outlook for the next 12 I, months. Everybody look, <clears throat> has got the same outlook. At least that's the consensus view right now, looking ahead to next year. Let's do a prepper. We're going to the wonderful Amy Wu Silverman here in a moment. There are in the Greek letters what are called four cross moments, which are the fancy mathiness of how you measure out there and the probabilities of out there. I'm not going to go into them, but one of them's kurtosis. I've got it on my right foot. And the answer is, John, you look at the Greek mathiness now and then that brings you humility in gaming June of next year. And no one heard the second bit of what you just said. No. That everyone just thought that is gross. <laughs> Senator Cassidy's recommends Not you get that Not even a real removed. thing, but just yeah, gross. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He gave me a prescription. <laughs> the doctor from Louisiana said, Tom, you're kurtosis. Let me fix that I think for people you. are Googling it right now. Please don't. Any <laughs> <laughs> futures on the S&P 500. No <laughs> Elon, please, no photos. Oh, my gosh. Unchanged. Here's the price action for you. Equity's going nowhere. Up almost a tenth of 1%. Yields going somewhere down mm. a couple of basis points on a 10-year, 355.70. In the FX market, came really close to 106 yesterday on euro dollar, back down to 105, 105.15, Tom. Positive two-tenths of 1%. I know we had a dash to Lisa, but, John, a negative 81 basis points, two-tenths two spread. What I do know. we do with 85 basis points? What, how do we analyze that? How far is this Fed willing to push it? And, Lisa, how much higher can that two-year yield go from here? It has been higher this year. Let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. About a month or so ago, intraday after payrolls, it got close to 480. So it's been higher. And we're wondering why it isn't higher now, given that some of the upside surprises that we've seen to some of the recent labor market data raises a question of just how much this economy is decelerating, if at all. Today, what we're looking at is the Georgia Senate runoff election. It will determine just how much of a majority or if the Senate will really will give uh, Democrats a 51 to 49 majority. It also really is a precursor to the presidential election in 2024 and gives some sort of tone there in terms of what voters' proclivities are. Today, we also have the Goldman Sachs Financial Services Conference. 
Sessions. Shanali Basak will be speaking with Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon. That's coming up in about an hour and 12 minutes. I'm very curious to hear what he has to say. Also, Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan speaking. And today, President Biden is going to be visiting the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company's construction site in Phoenix. We're going to be speaking with Brian Deese, his chief economic advisor, coming up here in uh, just about 10 minutes. How much do we get a sense of the emphasis on creating tech jobs and key jobs in the U.S. and then pair that with the alliance with, with Europe and then what that means in terms of the competition with China? Very cool. Looking forward to that conversation. 7.15 Eastern Time, 10 minutes away right here on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Joining us now, Amy Wu Silverman, Equity Derivative Strategist at RBC Capital Markets. Amy, can we begin with a consensus view for next year? Here's a quote for you. Evidence of slowing core inflation, peaking official rates and signs of economic recovery should pave the way for more risk-taking in the second half of 2023. I want to be clear here, Amy, I'm not picking on any single bank. That is the consensus view for next year. Do you share it? Yeah, it's interesting uh, because I think if you looked at any outlook, it would say almost the same thing. And when I was in Europe last week speaking with clients, that is also their view. I would say that, you know, it's it's really hard, hard to say the options market, when we look at pricing to that term structure, it is sort of 50-50. Essentially, you know, no one is placing big bets yet that we'll see this, you know, miraculous second half rally. But certainly that's the sentiment that is being expressed, but it is nowhere in the positioning right. yet. Amy, honored to have you with us. I've never seen the physics envy I see in this year's set of outlooks. You and I can look at time series and go mathy and all that. Guess what? Predicting out to January to me seems as uncertain as gaming June or December. How do you interpret not the indecision, but the pivotness that we see, the nodes, the points along 2023 where things are going to happen. Who are we kidding? We can't predict that. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot, Tom, and I think this year, more than any other year in the market, has really come down to positioning so much. Because if you think about it, last year, sentiment-wise, we were kind of in the same place. You know, there was a bearish outlook. We knew the Fed was going to go into a hiking cycle. But you saw that in equity skew. You saw that in your favorite word, in kurtosis, right? We saw so much hedging demand from last year to the beginning of this year, and you see none this year. Why is the positioning so different if the sentiment is the same? I think because people remain off sides or they've gone touristing in other markets and, you know, equity is just not that there is no alternative world anymore. What does the epsilon look like, that randomness, that systematic error off the backside of the algebra? What is the character of our uncertainty, our unknown? So, so here's where I would say I'm quite concerned in terms of tails. On the downside, what I've heard from a number of clients is a potential systemic risk in leveraged loans. You're starting to see that uh, you know, specifically in BKLN, which is the proxy ETF. That's a big downside risk. Geopolitics continue to play a downside risk, Taiwan or Russia and Ukraine. Now, on the upside, it's much more general. People just cannot miss rallies. You're seeing this in zero day to expiry trading. And that tells me that the reach for upside remains the pain trade, even though the sentiment remains bearish. I think those tails are not priced. Everyone's between 3,900 and 4,100 on their price targets. And yet those tails remain something that we need to watch for next year. Amy, I'd love you to elaborate on those uh, systemic risks, whether it's leveraged loans, whether it's the private markets, which a lot of people have been pointing to, whether it's just interest rate swap, uh, overlaid currency de debt issues that, that we're seeing, or just currency swap overlaid on top of debt. And this is something the Bank of International Settlements has been pointing to. What are you most concerned about? What's the transmission mechanism to the broader market that hasn't already yet taken place? So I think it's two things. I think you know, especially on the credit side, when we speak to credit investors, they they know these risks are out there. For instance, you know, if downgrades by the rating agencies in the fourth quarter of next year cause something in leveraged loans. I think what the concern is, is if the positioning, as I mentioned prior, is really all to the upside, right? So all your demand is sitting on that call wing, then you're going to get quite a cycle when people start to need to reach for that downside, because that downside tail, you know, a three standard deviation drawdown on the market, we measure that with TDEX, 
is trading in its second percentile over five years. People, people are not sitting on tails. They're not using downside protection right now. And so when that grab happens, I think it'll be quite violent. And when you have the VIX now, you know, back to a 20 handle, I think that can reflate quite quickly, Lisa. Amy, something I want to finish with is just to give you the opportunity to go over something you delivered a number of months ago. It was a note about why this market regime is going to come with more volatility, and that's going to stay with us for longer than many people think. Amy, can we finish there? What are you seeing and what have you seen through 2022 that you think we need to live with through 2023 and perhaps even beyond? Yeah, you know, I think one nuance that people forget because they're so fixated on where VIX goes from 30 to 40 is actually that if you've noticed all year, VIX essentially hasn't dropped below 20. So it's not necessarily that we're spiking to higher levels. During the pandemic, we hit a VIX of 80. It's that our floor has simply gotten higher. Our VIX is not moving below 20. And as a result of that, you know, the correlation component to volatility, it's a big component to old index volatilities, has remained high and I think will continue to remain high if that VIX floor does not come down from that 20 handle. I think we remember the years, Tom, when the floor was 10. Was that four or five years ago? Exactly. Or, yeah, 12. Oh, it's a yeah. big change. Yeah. It's a big, yeah. big change, that's for sure. It, it's a big, big change, you know, to, under, to, to take the rally from a 31-ish into a 20, a better market, a lower VIX as well. But I, I really have trouble framing, John, other than a massive bull market. How do you get from 20 to 17? That 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 There's a lot of inertial force that has to be overcome there. Amy's been brilliant. Amy, thank you for being with us. Amy Will Silverman there <clears throat> of RBC Capital Markets. Allow me to set the stage for you. Equity market yesterday, the close, about 4K on the S&P 500. The average, the average forecast for the S&P 500 year-end 2023, 4,009 on the S&P. So when we talk about this big recovery in 23, that's part of the consensus story. But really the fuller story, Tom, is the messy road to nowhere. They're looking for the first half yes. to be brutal and then this snapback rally through the second half, back to where we are right now how often is consensus even remotely right in in november december of the year previous i mean i just don't well, I we just can don't compare put and a contrast, lot of value in it and it's an exercise i'll go through in the next couple of weeks in the nine o'clock hour we'll look oh, back on you. the forecast that That's came good. 12 months ago and just how wrong some of those calls were and not just on the equity side i think the epicenter of getting the equity call wrong this year was getting the fed call wrong and the Federal Reserve is part of that too. Their projections well, for 2022 were so wildly off base. We're talking about a year of 400 basis points plus of rate hikes off the back of a projection 12 months ago looking for not even 100 from the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So that is a wildly, wildly wrong projection I, I would, from the Federal Reserve about what they themselves control, yeah. what they themselves will do. I would take it further in a different direction, which is we have lived a bond market we have literally never seen. I mean, I think it's completely removed from the Fed Derby. It's about price down, yield up, and how do we come and out we of that And we had a war mess. we didn't anticipate, Tom, yeah, in right. spring that Absolutely. changed the game in Europe in a monster fashion. David Solomon of Goldman Sachs in the next hour. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Voters in Georgia will decide today what the U.S. Senate will look like for the next two years. In a runoff election, they'll choose between Senator Raphael Warnock, a Democrat, or Republican Herschel Walker. Democrats already hold the majority, but a victory for Warnock would give them a 51st vote, which would make legislating slightly easier. President Biden likely to announce that he's running for re-election after the Christmas and New Year's holidays. That's according to White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. The president turned 80 last month and is already the oldest person ever to occupy the Oval Office. In China, a COVID outbreak that began last month appears to be tailing off. The nation reported a little more than 276,000 new cases on Monday. Infections have fallen each of the last eight days. At the same time, there's been a pullback in the sweeping testing regime in major cities. Now, officials there are seeking a more targeted method. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. and European Union are considering new tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. It would be part of a bid to fight carbon emissions and global overcapacity. It's a novel approach. The U.S. and EU would use tariffs, usually employed in trade disputes, to advance their climate agenda. 
President Biden will be in Arizona today when Taiwan Semiconductor announces plans to boost its investment in the state to $40 billion and build a second facility. TSMC is already constructing a $12 billion plant in Phoenix. The president will be joined by Apple CEO Tim Cook and Advanced Micro Devices CEO Lisa Su. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Making these chips in America is going to help lower the cost for families looking to buy a car, to replace your washing machine, get a new cell phone. It also helps companies outcompete the rest of the world. And I've got heard from Xi Jinping that he's a little concerned about that. That was the president of the United States at the end of October. That big effort picking up today, Tom. Apple CEO Tim Cook. Advanced Micro Devices CEO Lisa Su, alongside the president of the United States today, TK, in Arizona. <clears throat> For an event with Taiwan Semi. And I'm not going to mince words. This is newly minted at the Keene household. I feel lucky to have this. This is the fancy iPhone. For those of you on radio, it's a what we call Faro Purple. And it's we call it that Faro Purple. It, yeah, it's like Why? sort of like the Tots uniform, the kit that they the, have. The Away the third, Kit. The Away Kit, thank you. But um, I feel lucky to have this. The demand is so great that it's hard to find. Was there a waiting list? And, yeah, I had to wait like weeks. And the answer is they want to bring the stuff in here, the magic in here, over to America. That's all there is to it. Very cool. We're going to talk about that today. Tim Cook of Apple and other worthies will join the president of the United States in Barry Goldwater's Arizona. There's a calculus here of science and technology chips and security. Brian Deese, the director of National Economic Council for the president, is with us for an early morning brief before he travels to Arizona. I want to get right to the political economics of this, Brian, that you studied at Middlebury, which is, lo and behold, a Democratic runaway in Arizona, hearkening back to even 1950. If the president moves for investment, does that bring Democratic votes? I mean, is this a political victory lap for the president as well as a science victory lap? Well, the most impactful thing I've learned today is your color choices, Tom. But uh, what this is today is an, uh, a big milestone for the country for economic and national security reasons. As you said, inside that iPhone, but also importantly inside military applications, inside our most advanced computing applications, are these leading edge semiconductors. And today, we produce none of them in the United States, zero. Yeah. So TSMC's announcement today signals the beginning of building out that American supply chain. And the other thing we're gonna be doing in Phoenix, though, is underscoring that we're seeing this across the board. It's not just just in semiconductors, it's in clean energy innovation, it's in upgrading infrastructure. So you see across the Phoenix area, big investments in electric vehicle batteries, in um, in in the the fiber that will lay for uh, broadband across the country. That does bring big economic benefits, and I think a renewed right. sense of economic optimism to places like Phoenix. There has to be an inertial tip point where you push against all the foreign manufacture. What is your timeline, Brian? I mean, let's be honest, we're really not moving the global semiconductor needle here, but out there somewhere is where America gets a critical mass in manufacturing these complex processes, including lithium batteries. How long is the D's timeline to get to where we move the semiconductor needle? Well, look, these are big projects, and the key in this industry is scale. So that doesn't happen overnight. Building one of these fabs, like the president will see today, is a very complicated multi-year process. But the good news is that we now have enacted these long-term incentives. And I think that's one of the key pieces to understand about what we accomplished legislatively here in both clean energy and semiconductors. We now have incentives in place for multiple years, a decade really, and that gives private companies and private capital the ability to move in and move quickly. A lot of people say, well, but you know, we may not see the benefits of this for a couple of years, but we're seeing it right now in companies pulling forward investment and deciding to invest in the United States. So while the full timeline to build out the supply chain 
to produce chips here in the United States, to produce batteries here in the United States. That's a multi-year project. We are seeing in ways that a lot of people didn't think was possible activity, and that activity will result in economic opportunity in 2023. Brian, how concerned are you? How concerned is the president with some of the tension that this has caused with European allies who say that this is investment not going into Europe, that this is anti-competitive and really draws a lot more dollars to the U.S. and a lot more of the tech industry? Well, the president had a good conversation with President Macron uh, on that topic and other European uh, leaders as well. A couple of points. The first is the president makes no apology for the fact that his economic strategy is focused on generating more economic opportunity, more economic security and resilience for our economy uh, and our workers. At the same time, the opportunity globally for the U.S. leadership in these areas is quite significant. You know, in semiconductors, clean energy, these are areas where the world is short supply. We need more electric vehicle batteries globally. We need more semiconductors globally. So when the United States invests, pulls forward innovation, that lowers cost. That makes it easier to deploy in other jurisdictions as well. So certainly we're going to work with our partners and allies. Where there are concerns, we can sit down and talk about them. But the president's strategy here, an industrial strategy to make the United States an attractive place to invest, but also pull forward innovation and reduce cost, is one that will have benefits for the whole world. One of the problems with creating some of these policies historically has been that it has to be a longer term basis for that investment to bear fruit for those factories to actually take a stance. How important is consistency? And I say this at a time when President Biden, Ron Klain, was talking about this in the past couple of days, is expected to announce a running again. And members of of the Economic Council, Cecilia Rouse, I know, has talked about leaving uh, the council and others. I know that there have been rumors about yourself. How much is that important to kind of keeping things on the rails? Well, you're raising a really important point, which is if we're going to provide long-term incentives and certainty for private capital to invest here in the United States, we need policy certainty. But one of the important elements of what we got done over the course of the past year is that most of what we passed has broad bipartisan support. It certainly has bipartisan support outside Washington. You look at the Chips and Science Act, it had broad uh, bipartisan support in Congress as well. You've got Democrats and Republicans, but also uh, people, business leaders from across the country, from the center of the country, from the coasts, all kind of buying into this idea that having the United right. States as a leader in clean energy manufacturing, a leader in semiconductor production, that is a worthwhile right. long-term national investment. That'll help provide that stability that private investors need. You know, Brian, I love that you were wearing Hugo Boss to the state dinner the other night with Mr. Macron and all. You were enjoying your Rouge River blue cheese. Let me cut to the chase, Brian. How's our trade relationship with the French as we talk about the technology and all that? How are we doing? Look, I think the relationship as a whole is very strong and certainly undergirded by a great state visit. And it's always important when the two leaders have an opportunity to really sit with each other, spend time, break yeah, bread, I'll, and that happens that. here. Yeah. We have, yeah. look, you know, uh, we have our challenges, but we also are able as two, uh, two <coughs> countries to lift up. And there were really poignant moments, for example, at the state dinner uh, with the toasts of the two leaders marking just how our two countries have been there for each other when it really matters. And obviously, with Ukraine uh, and the, 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 the fight in Europe, the United States is proving once again that it's a reliable ally. We're going to have our concerns. We're right. going to have the issues that we're going to discuss. Uh, but, you know, overall, I think the relationship is quite in a, right. quite a strong place. Can you confirm he was actually in Hugo Boss? I think he was with, wearing with, Hugo Boss. With Arno in the building. You know, you know, Arno's in the building. I can, and I can, I can know, wearing Boss. I can, I can confirm definitively it wasn't Hugo Boss. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, can you confirm definitively you're staying with the administration? Can we wrap that one up? I, I can confirm that I'm totally focused on the work we have to do. We have a lot to do here between now and the end of the year. That's where my focus is. Completely. I can confirm you kind of dodged that one, but we we'll let it go. I can confirm that as well. <laughs> Brian, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. Thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. I, Brian Deester of the National back. Economic Council. I go back to semiconductor meetings from 40 years ago, and sure. we're all talking about this. Can we really move? We're, we get up to like 15 percent of manufacture. How do we do more? The president promised he'd make a push here. They're yeah. making a push here. Yeah. And we're seeing the likes of Apple get on board as well. The Europeans were always going to be annoyed by this. But the message, I think, for the Europeans is they've got to get their act together it's, as well. It's, I'd love to talk to Stiglitz about this. I mean, it's like a new globalization. It's really something new. Or the unwind of, of what yeah. we saw. The Stiglitz oh, yeah, covered I mean so that, well. Yeah. But, but I, I don't mean to make light. I mean, can you imagine if we were taking, you know, 
wine from France and bringing it over here. You know, we're well, going to do that already. We do. Yeah, but it's yeah. not the same. It's ooh, ooh, come to controversial. You know, I mean, Boone's Farm, I can go with it, but other than that, great lineup today. Ed Morse's City coming up next. Two hours away from the up and about this morning. Good morning to you. Equities lower yesterday. Biggest one-day loss on the S&P 500. Trying to pick it back up with futures positive. A little more than a tenth of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. Up a third of 1%. Looking for a bounce. Headline for me, for Lisa, for Tom in the bond market. Check out twos, tens and thirties right now. Wow. Yield curve yesterday, negative 80-something basis points. This morning, it's back on. Two-year yield down by a couple of basis points. The 10-year down by a couple of basis points as well. The yield curve, twos versus tens, negative, let's call it 81 basis points, something like that, Tom? Well, ne negative 82 basis points right now, and it's just the weight of it. Every seems like every bit of news, there's just an ability to take it out to a greater inversion. Where does it leave right now? the dollar story? Let's wrap it up in foreign exchange for you. Euro dollar all over the place, but still north of parity, yeah. 105.30. Came really close to 106 yesterday and backed away <laughs> off the back of the ISM. Really, the ISM yesterday, the epicenter of all the price action. Data in America, better than expected. Higher yields, stronger dollar. Tom, that's how we started the week. Take the two oil prices going up. You look at Brent crude, the global price, 81.56. And going down, as we've been over the last number of days, 75.88 on America's West Texas uh, Intermediate. So I think, you know, that we'll get to Ed Morse here in a moment, and that's uh, important to say the least. Well, Tom, I've mentioned this a few times when it comes to the commodity market. Where does China fit into all of this? And I think every single day we're waiting for another shift in a policy yeah, out of China. I agree. The latest this week, we've seen a shift at the city level with Shanghai and others backing away from testing requirements. The latest, Lisa, this morning, is Beijing, the capital just kind of backing away from the testing requirements over certain activities. And I would say that's the shift this week. Have we seen a drop wholesale of COVID zero? No, we haven't. It's kind of been incremental every single day. And every single day we hear less and less about protest and a little bit more about backing away from COVID zero. So how do you make sense of the oil price? We can talk about that with Ed Morris. If you really believe that there's some kind of reopening, why are we not seeing a bigger pop on the value of crude? What I'm looking at, things aren't moving around that much. It's a pretty uh, slow day, but we can see uh, some action. GitLab, interesting to see. It's a software company, and we've seen a number of software companies come out with lower than expected projections. This one beat expectations, raised forecasts. Those shares up more than 18 percent. Alcoa shares. This is interesting. The aluminum producer seeing a bit of a pop, not that much, three tenths of a percent, but right now. Now, given where markets are, that's a lot compared to the others. This comes after a Bloomberg report that the U.S. and Europe are talking about climate-based tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum, a way of pinpointing some of those uh, levies more specifically. Interesting that has to do with climate, and we'll get into more details, I'm sure, as we get further along. And then you can see General Electric. Uh, that was raised at, to outperform at Oppenheimer as a result of the aviation business, Tom. That is what perhaps we're seeing a one and a half percent drop. And, and, and finally, a splash with GE. They're getting out there with their three new companies. It's odd to see for someone that's on it. Again, you've got Bill Cohen's important book out on the collapse of General Electric as well. Now, a joy. Edward Morse honed hydrocarbon analysis in the street in a small shop called Lehman Brothers years ago. He did this off of his academic work at Princeton, his political economic work on oil over many decades, and now holds shop with Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup. We're thrilled he could join us today. With Ed, the call of the year. Let's go the other way. What did the $100 over a barrel people get wrong? They got wrong uh, both supply and demand, but more, more on the demand side. I mean, this was supposed to be a year, depending on whose projection you're looking at, that was going to continue that 5 or 6% demand growth uh, post-pandemic. And it just frittered out. It frittered out largely because of something nobody expected, namely uh, the pace of the slowdowns and the recessions emerging in the mm -hmm. three largest economies in the world, China, the U.S., uh, and obviously Europe. So uh, the demand side really is the the the, the big killer on this. Uh, we're looking at probably maybe 1.7 percent uh, demand growth this year compared to projections of four four percent or above. Right. 
What's interesting, Ed, to me is the prices we come down and everyone's rationalizing along the way to a price point where Riyadh reacts or Washington reacts, et cetera. What is the price point you have in your head where this becomes painful for the oil winners? Uh, well, the price point when it becomes really painful is going to be below 65. There's plenty of oil that can be productively, uh, uh, you know, exploited at 70. Uh, we start getting into uh, some fields that just don't work at 65, but uh, it gets unbelievably painful below 55. But we still have, and you just remarked on it, uh, the U.S. government having indicated it might start buying oil if WTI falls below 70. And I think that's the first test. I think OPEC has said, hey, we're going to stick to this. We're not going to change forecasts. Uh, we're not going to change our, our, uh, our oil projections of what we're putting in the market. Uh, maybe evaluate them in February, the next time their JMMC, the monitoring committee, meets. So uh, I think the next political move on managing the market will be up to the U.S. Ed up to the U.S.? How so? What are you looking for? Well, I, I, I go back to uh, the president's point that uh, at $70 a barrel, they can start buying back oil for the strategic reserve. Uh, and that's meant as an encouragement to the industry to keep drilling and to keep producing. So uh, we'll, it'll be a test to see what happens uh, and whether the president is serious about this or thinks that, hey, maybe this is the time when we're really getting off of oil uh, oh. because demand for it may be falling you know, faster than people thought. Why are we talking about the downside surprise at a time when China is potentially reopening, when these headlines don't seem to be moving the needle at all, even though this is definitely a big concern and people thought that perhaps it could send oil prices to $125 a barrel on Brent? Well, I take exception to that. You know, we had the China news that really did move the market. It moved the market up a little bit higher than the fundamentals warranted. And now we're having the good news in the U.S., the good news about the economy, which is really bad news in terms of the commodity markets, because it indicates that the Fed is going to keep going and raising the prices at the prior level that people thought. Uh, so the dollar gets more expensive, the economy slows down more, and demand for oil falls. So I think the, uh, the market is responding to news. It's just today's news is the good news in the U.S. Last week's news was the good news in China. But it's also this week, uh, this week that we're getting some news about China perhaps loosening some of the testing requirements in Beijing after reducing them in Shanghai just yesterday. How much does this sort of come together in something that does accelerate demand more than perhaps the base case, or is that not even on the table because of how much the Russian barrels are coming back on? I just am not understanding the price action at all right now, uh, based on some of the narratives people have been saying for a while. Well, the first thing you have to remember about the price action is liquidity is dried up even more than it already dried up. People are fleeing the market because of the level of market uncertainty and because we're getting toward the end of the year and those who made money this year don't want to lose any come the end of the year. So liquidity is dried up and when liquidity dries up, you get an incredible volatility coming out in the market. I think that's a, a very important point. The second point is the uncertainty about Russian oil. Uh, we thought that there was going to be a significant increase in demand for uh, oil from other sources uh, as Europe moved off of Russian oil. We actually had that, and it was an incredible increase in exports out of the United States. A week ago, the print was about 11,700,000 barrels a day of gross exports of crude oil and petroleum products out of the U.S. The U.S. has been replacing those Russian mm -hmm. barrels, and uh, you know we've had our inventories fall on the crude side, but they're rising on the product side. Uh, you know, this was right. supposed to be a period of time when diesel demand was going to be high and diesel cracks were going to stay at 40, and now diesel cracks are going down, and we're actually building an inventory. Right. So the data are mixed, but they're, they're, you know, they're equally bearish as they are bullish. Right. Ed Morris, I want to touch back on your uh, years of work with Woodrow Wilson at Princeton and Johns Hopkins and the rest as well. We have a miracle happening today. The president of the United States is going to attempt to turn the inertial force of globalization on its ear by traveling out to Arizona, where we're going to build semiconductors. From where you sit with your decades of experience, can we be successful in stealing back manufacturing processes from around the world? Uh, actually, I think we can. And uh, you mentioned uh, deglobalization effectively. 
we're not going to see trade growing the way it did in the in the go go years of 1990 to 2010. We're seeing all three major economies, China, the U.S., and Europe, putting blockages on trade and being a little bit protective. Here, there's a coincidence of interest between the U.S. and Europe based on what the Europeans are calling their CBAM, uh, their carbon border adjustment mechanism. Having the U.S. effectively putting the same CBAM on China uh, helps them competitively. Uh, so there's a, 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 a commonality of interest there. China's pulling back on trade because of energy security issues, and you might say commodity security issues. They want more made at home, or more imported, not by seaborne trade, but by on land trade, hence the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, hence the new pipelines uh, from Russia and the like. So we're seeing all three major economies pulling back from globalization, getting those supply chains at home. And uh, I think that's an important shift that's going to dominate the next decade. And I just want to squeeze this in just to blend two stories. She and Riyadh this week. What are you expecting from that meeting? The, the, the one thing you can expect is, uh, you know, greater ties on the oil market side. Uh, China and the Saudis already have an agreement on putting in uh, new refining, uh, testing out the Saudi technology to convert uh, oil directly into uh, petrochemicals. Uh, petrochemicals is where the growth and demand is going to be. Uh, the Saudis have a, a, an answer there. So, uh, so I think it's going to be uh, partly about of the world, partly about new align, alignments. Uh, the, the alignments are not going to, you know, be totally solidly moving to the uh, to the east for the Saudis. If you look at where their interests are in terms of uh, issuing bonds, in terms of uh, putting out shares on the IPOs of their state-owned enterprises, uh, they can't go away from London and New York. Uh, they can't get what they can get in London and New York provided by either Moscow or Beijing. But it is a move uh, solidifying uh, that line of, uh, of uh, purchasing of oil. The Saudis are there to provide oil that is kind of uh, under the table. It's meant to go into, into strategic stocks. The Chinese want, as the prices go down, to get their strategic stockpile built up to the level they want. They have Russia that's selling oil at a distress, and they're seeing what they can get from the Saudis as well. Ed, wonderful to catch up with you, sir, and wonderful call in the last couple of months. Ed Moss there of City. He was the cautious one, wasn't he? Just backing oh, away yeah. from that 100 Went completely footage against stuff. It. And as he mentioned earlier, and he gave us the math, of course, which is what Morse does. It's all about the demand miss that we got from the China shutdown. Up next, conversation you do not want to miss. Gene Soroka, the executive director at the Port of LA, Tom. He's here in New York with us. I'm looking forward to that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. It's runoff day in Georgia where voters will decide between Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock or Republican Herschel Walker, the former football star handpicked by Donald Trump. Polls show Warnock with a slight edge. The race will determine whether Democrats expand their thin majority in the Senate. Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. has proposed selling Taiwan as many as 100 of its most advanced Patriot anti-aircraft missiles. The deal, along with radar and support equipment, is valued at $882 million. It's a move that would only add to tensions between the U.S. and China. The Biden administration is concerned that Beijing is becoming more aggressive toward Taiwan. The global airline industry is set to post it's set to record its first post pandemic profit next year. According to IATA, the airline trade group, a travel rebound in the U.S. will offset the impact of ongoing COVID restrictions in China. Still, profit will be less than a fifth of what it was in 2019. And they're the small, inexpensive devices used to help you locate personal items like your keys or your bags. Well, now two women are suing Apple over its air tags because they say it allowed their exes to track them without their consent. The company upgraded safeguards earlier this year, but the women claim it's not enough and does little to warn individuals if they're being tracked. And actress Kirstie Alley has died. Allie was a favorite among millions of viewers in the late 80s and early 90s when she played Rebecca in the NBC series Cheers, winning an Emmy and a Golden Globe. In the late 90s, Allie starred in the sitcom Veronica's Closet. Her family said she had been battling cancer. Kirstie Alley was 71. 
Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. On the port negotiation, uh, I've been in it from the beginning. The West Coast dock workers, they're in current negotiation, and they have their own uh, bargaining uh, issues that they're working on, and they're moving forward on that issue. They're having those conversations, those dialogues. The difference is the companies in the dock workers came to the table at the beginning of the negotiation, not halfway through it. Marty Walsh with a lot to say about those negotiations. The U.S. Secretary of Labor speaking with me on Friday after Congress imposed laws averting a U.S. rail strike. From New York City this morning, Good morning to you all. Your price action shaping up as follows this Tuesday morning. We are firmer by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields coming back in, Tom, across the curve on a 10-year right now, down two basis points. Your 10-year, 354.97. All of America lean forward right now because we're going to try to clear this up, as John Farrell did with a really – John, I thought your interview with Secretary Walsh was terse and focused on what people don't want to talk about. We have this reticence to talk about the West Coast – labor discussions around docks and also now the rail strikes and the backdrop is your United Kingdom where the Telegraph literally has a strike chart on the front page. Yeah, over Christmas as well in the UK. Yeah, the so turmoil's that could get messy. There. So there it is. And we have the right guest to speak to now to give you clarity on radio and television. Gene Soroka is with us, executive director of the Port of Los Angeles. I'm going to let him describe what he does because he doesn't do the stereotype. I'm going to go back to my complete knowledge of docks and ports. Marlon Brando, 1954. On the water. And I think for most Americans, that's the stereotype. We fly into LAX and your world is down below and it's distant and it's removed. How much of all this tension that John Farrow talks to Secretary Walsh about, how much of this tension is labor union tension? There's not a day that goes by, Tom, that something in the supply chain doesn't affect us. Going back to new trade policy, COVID-19, consumer-based import surges, and now ongoing discussions with labor. In our case, the dock workers had been on the job an average of six days a week during the pandemic, moving records. So they didn't mail it in. I need to interrupt yeah. here because the stereotype out there in America is these guys are mailing it in. They're up having beverages at the Sunset Tower Hotel where they should be working on the dock. And you're saying they worked. Absolutely they did. The exchange, every average ship that comes into Los Angeles unloads and loads the entire vessel space. And that productivity is the best in the business today. Gene, you've lost a lot of volume. Can you walk us through how much volume you've lost to whom how much of it you think is lost forever and what on earth you can do about it to try and get it back? Yeah, it's not going to be just one person like myself doing it. It's got to be an industry movement. Over the last three months, John, we've lost about 25% of our cargo. We had an earlier than normal peak season. First seven months, we're on pace with the record that we set just last year. We also saw durables come down, as predicted. You're not going to buy a refrigerator every year. You're not going to buy those big, bulky furniture items. So that dissipated just a bit. But really, it's been the hand-wringing about a potential labor disruption that moved cargo to the east and Gulf Coast, even though both sides put out two joint releases saying they wouldn't strike and they wouldn't lock out labor. So you think it's lost forever? No, I don't. I think there will be a portion of it, maybe right now 5% of our overall volume, that sticks through those other gateways. And that's why I've been crisscrossing the country over the last month and a half, trying to share the ground truth and let folks know that productivity is still there and we have latent capacity. How do you convince them this isn't going to happen again? That is the tough part. Been around this industry for a long time, Lisa, and every time it looks a little bit different in these negotiations, whether it be our dock workers, recent rail workers, or others, we've got to give folks confidence that we can return certainty to the marketplace. Typically, these dock worker contracts go every six years, but folks have long memories. Well, and that's the reason why perhaps some of the business isn't going to come back and why some people are going to diversify more than they previously had. So what are some of those other regions doing in the Northeast, in the South, that is kind of challenging for you right now in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'll set the stage for you. Back in 2002, about 80 percent of the Trans-Pacific trade went through West Coast ports. Today, that's less than 60. 
Ports on the east and Gulf Coast have hired switched-on leadership. They've aligned with policymakers and elected officials, and they've put coalitions together to drive investment. Over the last decade, the federal government has out-invested West Coast ports 11 to 1. 11 oh, billion dollars. Again. 11, who's got the 11? Who's got the 1? East and Gulf Coast ports 11, West Coast ports 1, Tom. What did Speaker Pelosi do? Is she sleeping? This is where it's got to change with the investment, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act. We've been campaigning from Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti to Governor Gavin Newsom, the president and his administration. 40% of our nation's imports come through the Southern you, California you, gateways. Well, let, let, folks, this is really important. One in 50 jobs in the nation has to do with when we're flying into LAX looking down on Gene Sirocco's world, right? That's right. That's a legitimate number. And one in nine jobs in Southern okay. California, about a million paychecks go to that port effort. What's your biggest headache with the railroads? I mean, you were around when the Transcontinental Railroad came out of L.A. and went up through Utah. But when you wake up in the morning and you look at the next mile, if you will, you unload the boats and they're on freight, right? What, what do we need to do to get the freight game straight now, particularly after the strike that John mentioned with Secretary Walsh? Yeah. Tom, the permutations are so great. There are 200,000 companies that use this port to import and export every year. No one has a market share greater than 5%. By California law, we're a landlord. We're a real estate company. But we've created this outsized responsibility and our convening powers to bring okay, everybody to the is table. Is the railroads a bottleneck? And is the railroads controlled by Western Railroad guy? He's got a railroad in his attic in Omaha. Is this Warren Buffett's fault that the railroads can't get together with the port? I will tell you this. I need to make some news here, but let's blame this on Warren Buffett. Please. Over the last four years, with all of these impacts and everyone looking at the consumer consumer-based import surge, there have been about eight to ten micro trends throughout, including stuffing up of empty containers, surge of imports, and the bottlenecks the railroad saw. We've worked our way through that, but there'll be something else around the corner over the next hill. How many more takes do you want to take a Buffett? You still going? I, I just, I, I blaming, interviewed, I interviewed Warren, Warren Buffett once. We spent the whole time talking about his wonderful state-of-the-art train thing he's got up in mm. the attic. You know, Lionel, H.O. trains and all that. You're still trying to reschedule that interview. Yeah. I, 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 I read Snowflake. Warren, Gina, I want to finish here. I want to finish on the U.S. economy. We're all trying to work out where we are right now. Never mind the six to nine months. I don't know where we are right now. What are you seeing? What I see is the consumer continues to buy. The last four months of consumer spend numbers are more encouraging than many thought. Coming into the holidays, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, however we want to categorize these early days, encouraging. It's going to give us a chance in our industry as maybe one of those leading indicators to flush out some of the older inventory and get back on maybe a more normal cadence beginning at the first of the year. But so far, encouraged by the economy based on that consumer spend. Can I ask a question? Aaron Judge, Angels or Dodgers, which do you think? Oh, I got to pull for the Dodgers. You got to think the Dodgers. How much is that going to cost? Oh, fix that after Ver be. Verlander to the Mets yesterday, it's unimaginable. So what was Verlander? Fifty million a year? For Forty million a year, something like that. Where does that, that money come from? That's almost from? like what he's making. Can you explain from to me Newsom? where that money comes from when it's such a hyper low? Lisa, you're sport. the Mets fan. Please, you had a good day where does yesterday. That come from? Stevie Cohen. <laughs> but that's the right answer. It comes from the hedge fund backers. Yeah, baseball yeah. money blows my mind. I learned more about this. You know, and, and, and Gene is sort of removed from the labor debates and the trend. I learned more from him in 10 minutes. But than I think I've what we learned there months. from Gene was that we're not seeing the slowdown in the economy that I think many people anticipated. Yeah. Would that be right? And you're not looking for a recession next year either? No, I'm not. And what I also see is that what we don't discuss enough is the fact that we talk retail finished goods that are going to the store shelves and fulfillment centers. About the same amount of cargo coming through our port are parts and components for U.S. manufacturers. I was just with the Illinois Manufacturers Association in Chicago on Friday. Those folks are upbeat. Wow. I, what's, I, I got like 15 more questions. Well, you've I, got about 30 seconds. Just what's your big, what's the thing the media gets most wrong on that glorious dock that is one in 50 of our jobs. What's the thing that drives you nuts that people like us talk about? Now, it's the interdependency between all these nodes in the supply chain and participants that you have to look at. It's layered. It's nuanced. Okay. It's not just one throat to choke. It's not one lever you can pull. Can you see us doing a show 4 a.m.? From the docks of LA? Uh, 4 a.m., maybe the docks not. Of LA. I, I'd be happy to do a special, maybe a little bit later on in the evening. Oh, no, you do the early morning thing. Yeah. No, we've got to do the summer thing. You know, go to the West Coast, get some better weather. I think so. Uh, yeah. We can make that happen. Oh. Gene, this was great. This Let's was do this great. again. Thank you. Gene Soroka there, Executive Director of the Port of Los Angeles.
And I think his comments, Tom, lined up with Neil Dutter of Renmac pretty well in the last week or so. I'm going to talk a lot more about what Neil's got to say on this economy and looking forward also to see what David Solomon of Goldman Sachs, the chairman and CEO, has got to say in about 10 minutes' time. He's going to be sitting down, Tom, with Shanali Basak. That interview, moments away. It's going to be important. No question about it. The bonus pool, Tom. I want more clarity on the bonus pool. If you're a trader at Goldman, you've had a monster year. You've had a monster year. Yeah. And you're being told, Bramo, the bonus pool is smaller? Where are you going to get a job elsewhere? That's the key. That is the number one issue. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Much more still to come. The Goldman Chief Executive coming up very shortly. We continue to believe that there's another shoe that has to drop, and that is the economy. It's resilient today still. The market has priced and will be the cause of economic pain most likely in the year ahead. It feels like there's a lot of hope still that the U.S. can avoid a recession, that the Fed can micromanage this process. The Fed is going to keep at it until the job is done, and the latest data suggests they may have to keep at it a little bit more. Whenever the Fed stops hiking, how long does the Fed stay at those restrictive levels? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramus, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, worldwide, and far more at this moment for Global Wall Street. We welcome you with Shanali Basak in a conversation with Goldman Sachs Chief Executive Officer David Solomon. Because of Mr. Solomon's schedule, we're going to get right uh, to this. We note that the gentleman from Hamilton College applied to Goldman Sachs a few years ago, Shanali and was rejected. That rejected was swept aside over the years and the investment banker replacing Lloyd Blankfein about four years ago leads Goldman Sachs forward into 2023. At their conference, our Shanali Basak. Tom, thank you so much for your time. And David, thank you for joining us. You know, you have this conference here. You're entering your fifth year as CEO. You're in such a different place than you were even six months ago. Your stock is actually holding up better than every single one of your rivals. But the reality, too, is here that everyone is preparing for what could be a mild or even deeper recession. As the CEO of Goldman Sachs, how do you prepare your bank for that? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I'm delighted to be here with you. And I appreciate your being at our Financial Services Conference. This is the 33rd year. We've got a terrific group of clients here, and it's a great time to kind of reflect on our industry and really look at our industry going forward. I think you framed it just just correctly. We're at a very uncertain time, an uncertain time given we're changing monetary and economic conditions very, very quickly. And that's certainly having an impact to slowing down economic activity. And so if you're running a big financial services firm, I think you have to assume that we have some bumpy times ahead and you have to be a little bit more cautious with your financial resources, with your sizing and the footprint of the organization. I think you have to expect that activity levels are going to be more constrained in a tougher economic environment. So we have businesses that are very, very correlated to economic growth in the world, and we're predicting economic growth will slow. Our, our economists predict 1.9% economic growth around the world uh, in 2023, which is obviously slowing growth. And the big question is, as central banks tighten monetary conditions and try to control inflation, can they do that and orchestrate, orchestrate some sort of a soft landing? And I, you know, I think that's still uncertain. I think there's a possibility of that. But I certainly think we could see a recession in 2023 also. And so I think you've got to be cautious and prepare. How, then, do you prepare your staff around all of this? It's December, it's the end of the year. People are worried about jobs. People are thinking about jobs. They're thinking about pay as well. It's bonus season coming up. We've reported that you are even thinking about having lower bonuses at businesses that will have rising revenue this year. How are you thinking about this? Bring us inside your decision-making process and uh, what you're telling your staff right now. Well, we, we operate a business where every single year um, we have to pay our most important asset, which is our people. It shouldn't be surprising to people watching the performance of the business this year that 2021 was an exceptional year. It was a record year for the firm was the highest debt revenue year ever for the firm. 2022 is a different year, and so naturally, compensation will be lower. We're still early in the process of making those decisions, but just like every year, we pay for performance, and we will pay people based on the overall performance of the firm, and especially for our senior people. Um, you know, we, we consider the overall performance of the firm as we go through our compensation process. 
How do you balance also, you know, this year you had been reintroduced the, you know, the natural calling of headcount. The bonus discussion is not just here. It's obviously everywhere on Wall Street. How do you balance that with kind of the story that we saw just a year ago, this talent war that we saw, this booming market for people? And what's happening this year going into next year into tougher times? How do you balance retention as well as those more difficult conversations? Well, we, we take a very long-term view with, with everything we do. And you have to adjust to the environment, and so you make changes around the margin. Um, but at the same point, you know, you take a long-term view, and you try to think about your business over time. We're extremely focused on serving our clients and our core businesses. Um, our clients have been active, and so it's important for us to strike the right balance in protecting our franchise and making sure um, that our people are paid for performance. On the other hand, we're in an environment that's a tougher environment broadly. Performance is not as strong, and so we balance that. But we take a long-term view. Our people take a long-term view. Um, but I just made some comments in the, uh, in the Financial Services Forum where I said that I'm surprised by how resilient the competition for talent is. And by the way, this is just not in our industry. You're seeing across the United States and around the world that labor is still relatively tight. Talent war is not over. Talent, well, the talent war is, is, is um, I think there's some headwinds given we're changing economic conditions. But the competition for talent is still very, very strong. Now, how that evolves in 2023 is unknown. Certainly, if we have a slower economic environment, it will have an effect. You can see across all industries, not just tech, that people are thinking about their headcount size and they're making, let's say, pruning cuts or adjustments just because they feel more margin pressure coming. So financial services is not immune to that. And I think we all have to watch the environment and make the right long-term decisions for our organizations and for our shareholders. Whether it's headcount or otherwise, as you think about this kind of tougher economic environment, the uncertainty, do you think Goldman is going to have to pursue another round of cost cuts in any fashion? And if that were to be the case, where could you see them? Well, we, we always look at the environment and we always size the firm to the environment. If the environment gets tougher, we will obviously make decisions to size the footprint of the firm appropriately. That can come from slowing down hiring, which we've already done considerably in the second half of the year. Um, and that might also come from pruning in certain areas. So switching gears a little bit here, kind of broader financial services picture and talent war and whatnot. Last year, fintech, crypto firms booming. I'm curious whether the collapse of FTX is making you think in any fashion differently about crypto as an industry and the ability to potentially invest in some firms, maybe buy some assets here. Well, I've, I've been very clear on my view around this space. I think the underlying technology of blockchain is extremely interesting. I think there are enormous opportunities for blockchain to play a role in evolving the infrastructure of our financial system. I think there's an enormous amount of friction in the way money moves. I think there are a variety of ways that this technology can be used to allow more participation and inclusive participation in financial activities. I think it can break down barriers. That has nothing to do with Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency. I don't, I don't really you know, offer a view on, on cryptocurrencies. I think they're highly speculative. They may hold value, they may not. But I'm interested in the underlying technology and how the underlying technology can help serve our clients, our customers, and really take friction out of the financial system and also help make it more accessible. But the reality, too, is kind of Goldman was pretty early in the market here when it came to futures trading, when it came to the industry at large. Do you think that there's a chance to lean in or is there still too many regulatory risks? Well, we, we, when, when you say we're early, we've done a very narrow um, selection of things around this broad area because from a regulatory perspective, we're extremely limited in terms of our participation. Um, and I don't, I don't see that changing um, in the immediate future. And so we want to be available to give our clients advice and insight into how we think about some of these things. Um, but our activities are extremely limited in the space. I want to take a moment to realize it's about to be a big moment. You're five that you're becoming CEO here, that you've been running this firm for. Is there anything you didn't do in the first five years that will kind of be at the top of your list here to execute as you enter this kind of new phase? Well, we laid out, and I know you were there because you covered it as a reporter our, in our first investor day three years ago, a desire to grow the firm, to diversify its revenue base, and make it more durable, to operate the firm more efficiently. And in particular, we focused on the opportunities for us in asset management and wealth management. And on our recent reorganization, we've now got those businesses together. We run the fifth largest active asset manager in the world. We have a jewel of a wealth management business. And we see real opportunity in the coming years to continue to grow that. And so we're on a journey to diversify the firm. I think the thing that we're most proud of over the course of the first few years, and I think our team's done an extraordinary job, is at the time of that investor day, 
there was a lot of skepticism about our markets franchise, particularly our FIC franchise, the returns we could generate, our client position in that business, and we've really strengthened that business. That is a leading franchise that's performing very well. We've taken over 300 basis points of market share in that franchise, and that's really made the firm, it's our biggest business, it's made the firm much stronger. How do you and we've really focused, we've really focused, I'm sorry to, yeah, to interrupt you for a second, Smalley, we've really focused on the client experience and making sure that the way we serve our clients is really, really differentiated. And we're getting great feedback from, from clients on that, and that's strengthening our business. So we're on this journey to diversify the business, to strengthen the business. I think we've made a lot of progress, but we have a lot of work to do. And, um, and we continue to focus on, on growing and strengthening the firm. So you're leaning into so much of the core of Goldman Sachs. A couple of months ago, you announced this general realignment, let's say, of Marcus and the consumer strategy. Do you expect more big changes to be announced ahead as you have your next big investor day coming up? Do you think that you'll have a target here? Do you have any sense of when it can become profitable? Well, we, we made a very purposeful decision in this reorganization, which was a significant decision, to organize the business into three units, our asset wealth management business, which we were just discussing, our banking and markets business, which I was highlighting the strength of the markets franchise, and obviously our investment banking franchise is a, is a leading franchise. And we took our platform businesses, transaction banking, and our consumer platforms, and we put them together. We narrowed our focus purposefully on our consumer business and tried to align it with things that we think really play to our strength, whether it's the technology development of platforms, our relationship to enterprise businesses, and also in alignment with our wealth business. With that narrowed focus, we're gonna be very, very uh, attentive to making sure we scale those platforms and they're profitable as quickly as possible. David, year five, you look around um, all of corporate America, not just Wall Street, really, and you see so many companies, as they think about succession planning, the CEOs have had to come back <laughs> on multiple occasions. You see it at Disney, you've seen it at Carlisle. But when it comes to Goldman Sachs, how are you thinking about succession planning now as you kind of move into this next part of your I, I career? Am, I, am, I am in year five. I've got a great team. We're working on all the things we were just talking about, and that's what I'm focused on. And there'll be a, you know, there'll be a time when it will be uh, someone else's turn to steward this great institution that's been around for 153, 154 years. And at that time, you know, we'll make the, we'll make the appropriate decisions. But for right now, this leadership team is really focused on continuing to grow and strengthen Goldman Sachs. And we feel like we've made a lot of progress, but we also feel like there's a lot that we can do. And we're excited to talk about some more of that in February. I'm looking forward to this Investor Day. Thank you so much for taking time with us on a really big day here at Goldman. You said 33-year conference? 33 years of the conference. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's nice to be with you. Nice back to you. Shanali brilliant, as always, and looking forward to your coverage for the rest of the day on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Always a tough question to ask at the end to the current CEO, What's the plan not to be the CEO in the years to come? I think that um, he appropriately dodged that particular Just, question. So. You know, and again, time has moved on with the pandemic and it was off four years on from blank fine and all the uproar. And I think everybody's written about it. Everybody knows, say, Bill Cohen's wonderful book on Goldman Sachs and that. And Shanelle touched on it later in the conversation. And to me, it's the Goldman Sachs focus here away from their excellences that we all know and some of the challenges and wealth management, that competition. You're thinking about Marcus, Morgan aren't you? Stanley and the powerhouse just credit it. suisse. Come on, it's, it's the wind Marcus. Up. He's still going. Is it, is it going to be a Marcus 2023? Only Bill Cohen knows what Marcus means. That was the founder's name. Uh, doing this organically is tough. Tom, you know that. It's difficult. From the ground up. Of yeah. Course. And, and you that's know, what the, they're doing. Doing it in Salt Lake City. Full disclosure, I've got a family member linked into that. But, you know, the, the bottom line is, to me, that's the big experiment here. Goldman Sachs and consumer banking. A couple of comments there as well about next year 2023 how it evolves is unknown the competition for talent is still very very strong that's how we characterize things right here right now lisa which raises some questions about what shrinking the bonus pool is going to do or whether that just means that some people get everything and other people get nothing and whether there's attrition this is the conundrum it still is good for a lot of workers for a lot of companies so what how do you plan for a time for that second half of 2023 what happened to the days of the first news. year analysts doing powerpoint presentations to the c-suite <laughs> and saying you don't pay us enough <laughs> do you remember that all the time you, yeah. know, you don't pay us we want more vacation i only want to do six hour work days yeah, yeah i remember that it was totally on board ago. with them. They were doing great. What happened? <laughs> you were like, can I be <laughs> you with keep you? going, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
feels like there's a lot of hope still that the U.S. can avoid a recession, that the Fed can micromanage this process. And I think people are forgetting that monetary policy is a sledgehammer. It's not a scalpel. And so there's a little too much optimism embedded in markets. Ron Temple was great. We caught up with the multi-asset co-head over at Lazard Asset Management in the last couple of days from New York City this morning. Good morning with Tom Keane and Lisa Bramitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Just to feel a quick snapshot of the market for you. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. Yields are lower by about a basis point. Negative one basis point to 356.43. I think what you heard from Ron Temple there, Tom, is a complaint that you've made repeatedly over the last couple of weeks. It's just that we're getting too cute. Too about cute. the runway Never for 2023. Never seen it. First half's going to be difficult. Second <clears> half's going to be better. The Fed's going to go too far. You get the growth concerns, and then all of a sudden you get a rip roaring rally I, to win the second half. I, 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 I'm, I'm literally speechless about it. And my number one question, John, is why are we here? And it's because <laughs> the theoretical frameworks are gone. Lisa's all asking of, herself that question all, right all now. Of our, <laughs> no, just, no, but, you know, but, but just carry on, please. Folks, all Why? of our theory, and Powell Why? alluded to this. It's a Zen moment over there. Powell alluded to Super this, zen. which is he was spouting out theory like the beverage curve, the Taylor rule, dot, dot, dot. None of that works in the supply side disruptions that we're seeing. Witness our wonderful conversation with a gentleman from the Port of Los Angeles. This is unique where we are, so we get to this cuteness. Well, he's talking about the flow of business right now, and he wasn't too concerned. No. Volume's heard... still pretty robust, decent, going into 2023. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, what else to say. That that seems to be the minority pushback, I would I, would I agree, say. I agree. And I think we got a little snapshot <clears throat> of that from Mr. Solomon over at Goldman moments ago. Lisa, you got a comment on this? I mean, you're awfully quiet over there today. She's in the Zen room. She's, I'm, I'm just she's also asking herself, why, <laughs> why am I here? No, I think you guys covered it well. Let's find out from Lisa Shallot. I'm curious, because I've personally, okay. how do you be in the crystal ball room? I want to know about the crystal ball well, that Mike Wilson holds and just, you know, how specific it gets. Does it get granular about the Fed's right. thought process? She's got a plaque on her door at Morgan Stanley. It says, lose the cute. Lisa Shallot's with this chief investment officer, <laughs> Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. Lisa, I've never seen an outlook season like this. My head is spinning. Spinning over the cuteness, as John aptly puts it, over the the surgical nature of where we're going to be the third week of May. I don't buy it. Give us a bigger, broader vision so I can sleep at night. <laughs> well, look, I, I think our bigger, broader vision is that, you know, right now we're in this period of time where we're still resolving this what had been a profound mix shift in our humble opinion between goods and services. And so you're seeing this disconnect where there's still, we're exhausting pent up demand uh, for services. We're going through the holidays for a lot of folks. Uh, they're still kind of playing out that they're, you know, I haven't celebrated with family and friends and traveled across the country or quite frankly, across the world for two and a half years. And so we're still seeing that. Uh, but to us, what the risk is, is that the consumer, while the labor market is strong and we, we're in the camp that says there are structural changes in the labor market that are going to keep it robust, uh, the reality is, is that consumers are starting to run out of dough. And, uh, you know, the savings rate is now back where we were uh, in 2007 at 2.3 percent. That's 15 year low. Uh, we've got credit card revolving balances, you know, building up. We're way through the, the 2019 high. And so, you know, as we get into 2023, we think everything rests with the consumer. And we really think that this could go either way. And that what analysts seem to be uh, uh, forgetting, and look, I'm going to throw CEOs in there. Uh, you know, yes, CEO confidence is deteriorating, but I still think a lot of corporate guidance is delusional. Uh, in terms of the fact that they, over the past two years, benefited from both a pull forward in volume and, you know, seven, eight percent pricing power. Um, so you're talking about nominal top lines that were in, growing in the double digits. If 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 the Fed succeeds, if the Fed pauses, which is what all the enthusiasm is about, that pricing power at best is going to have and at worst is going to go away completely uh, at the same time that your volumes are slowing. 
And it's that kind of negative operating leverage that I just don't think is in the numbers. You know, and, and Tom and, 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 and John and Lisa, I know you guys know me and, and know I started my career covering companies like Caterpillar and Deer. I know what negative operating leverage looks like. Uh, Mike Wilson, my colleague, you know, started his career, you know, as as uh, you know, as a specialist on semiconductors. He knows what negative operating leverage looks like, uh, and we don't think that that there's enough attention to that in the current consensus numbers. So, Lisa, when you say that CEOs are delusional, are you talking about the whole of corporate America, or a specific slice of it? Which one is it? Yeah, it's more it's more the specific slice of it, but it's the slice that unfortunately at, at the minute, uh, you know, uh, dominates the, the the market cap and the weight uh, of how we're comprising, you know, consensus estimates. And so, um, you know, I, I just think it's going to be a rude awakening for uh, a lot of folks in some of these mega cap names and some of the consumer discretionary leverage names in the e-commerce, social media ecosystems, which increasingly are purely cyclical. Um, and and uh, I think we need to remember that. So how much more of a downside do you see in some of the tech world, considering how much we've already seen losses there? Yeah. Um, you know, our best guess, and, and you guys I know have, have spoken to Mike regularly, um, you know, he most recently took down uh, his 2023 estimates to 195. Uh, I think the consensus, the forward consensus is still just below 230 uh, next year. So, you know, we're looking for a number that's that's 15 percent below that. Is the austerity that's hitting some of these companies, Lisa, changes your mind on any of this? When Andy Jassy and Amazon start considering cuts, when Meta and Zuckerberg I, I, start considering cuts, does that change your view? Um, it um, Very modestly, because, I, again, I think... Um, that, you know, certainly does that help marginally in the decimal points on on, on margin? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's going to, to make up for what we think is going to be material loss uh, of momentum on that top line from loss of volume and loss of pricing. Interesting. Lisa, just phenomenal this year. Just fantastic alongside Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley. Just absolutely brilliant. Tom, throughout the whole of 2022, just guiding us through a very, very messy market. It's not a small matter. We make light of asset allocation and we have cliches like 60-40 or 60-30, 10, 10% in cash. But what's there is the marginal reallocation, not maybe every quarter, but every year. And it, it really matters in terms of the long-term return. Witness bonds this year. The headwinds to earnings still to come. The warnings from Morgan well, Stanley. certainly out there. The gloom's out there. And I asked Wrong the question about tech austerity. Now what? Now? Does it make a difference, Bramo? <clears throat> the answer you got, not much of one. Look, the balance of risk around this view, this all comes down to the timing. Morgan Stanley would be the first one to admit that. They're looking for this slowdown. Let's talk about the timing. Is there a bigger risk that this slowdown gets pushed out or brought forward? Lisa, which one is it? Pushed out. That's my hunch. Based on the incoming based, information. Based on the incoming information, if the market comes in harder than expected, and, and Neil Dutta was actually brilliant on this, that if the slowdown isn't as much of a slowdown, that's actually really negative for risk assets because it means the Fed can go further and we'll have to hold rates there for longer, which will be a much jerkier stop to this economic So growth. what are we talking about here? Fed funds closer to six? Not for you. I mean, for, <laughs> the, for, for, for the Neil Dutters of this world who believe that this economy is far more resilient, robust than people make out. Are they saying that's the upside risk on Fed funds? Five and a half percent, for example, for the entirety of next year, which not is not baked into the market at all. And then what does that do to some of these assets that already are still going and still have some momentum? This really is the pushback. And then you don't get some sort of lovely 2023 <laughs> pullback and, and, you know, everything is roses again and we get back to where Grandma we are now. hasn't talked enough today. I mean, the gloom is just great. I mean, she's framing out what a lot of seriously what a lot of people feel. There's the, you, the, Lisa's sounding constructive. Are you in shock? No, I just think I think there's this, there's huge uncertainty out there. You see it in some of the hedge fund, fancy hedge fund statistics as well. There isn't a belief in this market. So in about 30 minutes on the open on Bloomberg TV, we're going to lead with this. Is this economy slowing down or picking up? And we're going to have that conversation with Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Megan Green of the Crawl and Institute. Eric Nelson of Wells Fargo was really strong last time he was on on currency. Eric payments. Nelson thinks that yields are too low going into 2023 and they need to pick back up. We'll get his view on that in just a moment. Equity futures just about positive. 
This is Bloomberg. Economics today, trade number as well. Red and green on the screen here. In the bond space, yields are lower a bit. And the headline, which we are going to sit on for a moment, is further curve inversion. A very important statistic. We are now out to a negative 83 basis points. And Lisa Bram, what's the trend here over the last number of days has been further inversion. Why isn't it more inverted? That's what I would ask, completely honestly. I know this sounds crazy, but uh, given the projections that people are talking about and the <clears> upside <throat> surprises that we've gotten in recent economic data, the fact that one person after another says that the labor market is strong, why are we not seeing that two-year yield higher and prospects of longer term even lower? And the dynamic, of course, of the 10-year yield as well. What other spreads matter right now? This is your world. I mean, we, I spend time as an amateur on the 210 spread. What is the spread that uh, you know, you're studying away from uh, what someone like me covers? People are looking at credit markets and the lack of concern in credit markets. Mm -hmm. People aren't worried about defaults. You are seeing yields, uh, basically the spread, the extra yield for riskier credit come in some of the lowest levels Them in months. High yields doing basically, better than you'd expect. It's doing expect. better yeah, than you'd yeah, expect yeah. at a time when people think that you're heading into a turn, turn, downturn because we might and, not and be. We, I, I prepared this, folks. I got in at like 5.52 this morning, eight minutes before the show, and, and this is the first thing I looked at, which is uh, Lisa gets in at 3 a.m., I should point out. And, and the thing I looked at, Lisa, are the continued conversations we have about watch out for liquidity next year. This is percolating. It's on the edge of the zeitgeist right now. Is yeah. It's a liquidity and it has a lot of words, you know, a lot of meanings within this market. Agreed. People aren't Agreed. talking about credit markets in the typical way. They're talking right. about liquidity in other instruments, <clears throat> no. private credit that perhaps hasn't repriced. Although, is this a repricing? No. I don't know. Bank it's of International really Settlements <laughs> out of Geneva with a really important FX swap paper. I'll try to get that out on Twitter that today. Was good. It's wicked nerdy and all that, but it definitely harkens to some of the risks of 2023. Right now, we are going to turn within the jumble of this economy to someone who prints your paycheck. Neela Richardson sits in the printing okay. shop at Automatic Data Processing and puts the seal. The sig Is your signature on all our paychecks? Is it like the U.S. dollar? I'm working on that for 2023. That for, <laughs> yeah. is it gonna be, are you going to have a legible just signature a on stamp, our paychecks? But yeah. It's just going to say, love, Neela. Eight <laughs> zeros. That'd be nice if you got that on your paycheck. That would be good. And ADP, <laughs> Neela Richardson, their chief economist, joins us at right now. I love, 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 love the top of your research note where you go to the three ratios, which the media never talks about, mm -hmm. which is the productivity of America. And the bottom line is it's a mystery and we don't know much about it. And your bold assumption is there is a hollowness to the productivity of America. Discuss. That's right. So we've talked about the strong labor market. It's a strong labor market that's hollow because despite a lot of innovation that's happened, especially over the last three years, the simple fact is that Americans are working more and producing less. And that is not a sustainable growth dynamic because how do countries mm -hmm. grow? Two reasons, more workers getting more productive. End of story. Within the three-part ADP study of their report, are we working less or less efficiently at a big cap, the middle market, which is really important, mm -hmm. or at the small business market? <laughs> do, we, do we blame someone for this? I have to say, I don't have a treatise on the small business market, but I do talk to a lot of small businesses, and they are working really, really hard. But they are uh, crippled in some ways in terms of efficiency by worker turnover, especially when you talk about consumer-facing mom-and-pop shops, getting workers in the door, first of all, and getting them to stay, second of our all, is really, really difficult. So you're constantly retraining people. Which is possibly the reason why we keep hearing about a white-collar recession, mm -hmm. that this is going to be a downturn in the number of jobs in offices, in the headquarters, in the corporate suites that we just heard about from PepsiCo, because on the ground, they can't get enough people still. But in the offices, they have too many. Is that really the nature of what we're looking at? You know, I, I think this <laughs> labor market is really complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is because firms have hired in different stages with different intensities. So I don't know. I actually don't think that it's a foregone conclusion that we'll see a recession in any segment of the labor market. I do think we'll see a transition. And that's 
we talk about the cyclical, but there's a lot of structural going on. And structurally, our business is positioned to capture an increasingly digitized global economy. That's the question. So some of the, the layoffs or even the lack of hiring might be a repositioning by businesses, <clears throat> especially large ones, to take uh, into account the structural dynamics that are going on post-pandemic. I don't understand how we get to a more productive future if we don't get the layoffs that come with that. Because there is this thought that productivity has to mean fewer workers, maybe more robots, maybe more AI, maybe more chat boxes. But if you really look at what drives productivity, it's making people more efficient and effective. And so that isn't just AI. I'm not saying that AI doesn't have a strong place in American business. It also means skill development apprenticeships, vocational training, all that bread and butter stuff that we don't always talk about but leads to a more productive workforce. I'm looking at this. I love what you're saying here, and I've had a conversation with the laureate Paul Romer on this on his ability to judge his wheelhouse, which is technology applied across the economy. And so we talk about, and Dominic Constant at Mizzou is great on this, capital deepening, which I think is something that many of our listeners and viewers intuitively get. There's a technology deepening that cuts both ways. I strongly agree with your analysis of large cap that basically they're laying off jobs where they can't use them, et cetera, and they're going to turn right around and rehire in the technology-specific areas. Is that going to percolate down? As Trichet says, is that going to diffuse down to other businesses? Not automatically. And I think this is the fallacy of technology, that as long as it's there, it'll be adopted. But actually, businesses have to change operations to really leverage technology, and they have to skill up people around that technology in order to make it them more efficient. So it's a not on an automatic yes, and that's why we're seeing technology <clears throat> kind of percolate okay. in the larger companies, not trickling down to that mid-market small business, which, as we know, are the drivers of the labor market. They create two-thirds of the of the new job. So we definitely want tech in that stream because that's what leads to a more productive workforce and, overall. And this goes to the ADP heritage, which is, this is really important, folks. I'm going to try to avoid the economic mumbo-jumbo here is best. Move that, move that camera back to Cleveland. I don't look good today. Senator <laughs> Cassidy said I don't look good. Move that camera back Back to Cleveland. That is a lie. You look great, Tom. But, well, <laughs> but we're trying. But Neela, monopsony. Okay, now you can take monopsony. Monopsony, folks, is like a rubber plantation in Singapore. They buy all the rubber product. They control the price. Are we going to have a monopsonistic, technology philic, big cap America that's going to leave the rest of America flat on its back because they can't utilize that technology? There's one other voting member, it's the consumer. And if you want to do business in this country, you have to move to where the consumer has moved. And we know the consumer has become more digitized. It has embraced digital economy. We want everything cheaper and faster. That's not going away. That didn't, didn't go to sleep during the pandemic. It was only accelerated. If the consumer right. is the person you're after, which every business is, then businesses right. will adapt. Lisa Davos, one season years and years ago, not one but two major CEOs of banks said to me two days apart, we've completely underestimated the take-in of technology by older bank customers. They both said that separately. The consumer wanted digital way back before Zelle and all that. How do you invest in it at a time where money is tight, where there is credit constraints, where the outlook is coming down, right? I mean, that's one of the big issues, which raises a question. What gives if you have the wage price spiral that Andrew Hollenhorst is talking about, uh, but you also have a, a lack of productivity and something that needs to be remedied on the other side? We need wages to go up. Main Street needs wage increases. Inflation is too high. And I will contend that this current inflation uh, battle is not one-off, that we are going to see persistent inflation well into the future because the supply chain dynamics have changed and people movement has changed and the lack of immigration in advanced economies have, has slowed. Labor shortages, if you look at what J Chair Powell's speech uh, last week when he said that there are three and a half million missing workers and many of them are retirees, that dynamic has changed. All that means is that in order to get the kind of efficiency that we need that actually produces profits, 
and increase standards of living, we need productivity. Right now, wages are going up, but it's because firms are competing with each other for headcount. That's not a good reason for wage increases. And you think that that's likely to continue because it needs to and because of some of these structural changes. So based on all of that, do you think other economists that the market at large is overly complacent that we're going to see a real deceleration and then we're going to have a path to 2% inflation in the U.S. by the end of 2024? First of all, I think most people are overly concerned with recession. Yeah. If you talk to American business, if you talk to small and large businesses, they're not talking about whether we'll see two quarter drops. They're talking about how to get consumers in the door and how to make sure they have enough people to serve them. And so what what gets us to 2% inflation is advanced productivity. It's a, a whether at the corporate level or the policy level in which we are actually endowing workers with skills needed for the next 10 years of the economy, of the global economy, and not the past 10 years. Okay, well, I have to see. It's interesting. Uh, this say the the least. Carlos Rodriguez emails in and says Nina like Richardson Carlos, does not <laughs> sign our ADP paycheck. She wanted oh, to make clear, on. Mr. Rodriguez wanted to make clear <laughs> that you're not signing. Okay, Carlos's point is very well taken. Carlos, I'm sorry if I uh, offended you. <laughs> Back to Neil Richard, thank you so much. <laughs> From Carlos Rodriguez, AD at P as well. Lisa, that's the kind of conversation that, that I hope we invented in surveillance. Productivity is complex by definition. It's a triple ratio with six moving parts. How do we get that investment? How do we get that investment from the public sector at a time when nobody wants to spend money because that was something that's being blamed for some of the inflationary push? How do we spend money on a corporate sense if people can't borrow money for, for free anymore? How do we get that's that investment at a time mm. when you know, margins haven't compressed enough and are yeah. they willing to see that compression? To me, that's the real question, because without that investment, we don't get productivity up and we don't get inflation back down, especially given the trajectory that a lot of companies see the economy I would, on. I would have two comments on that. The pandemic influence that we are still living in is part of the investment problem. But the huge one, which and this goes to my zombie 2023, is all of a sudden it's not a dire straits economy. It is not money for nothing. And it's, this is a profound change, folks, that we will cover on radio and television into next year uh, as well. Right now, red and green on the screen, the VIX above that 1819 level, 20.62. Bloomberg surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Voters in Georgia will decide today what the U.S. Senate will look like for the next two years. In a runoff election, they'll choose between Senator Raphael Warnock, a Democrat, or Republican Herschel Walker. Democrats already hold the majority, but a victory for Warnock would give them a 51st vote, which would make legislating slightly easier. President Biden likely to announce that he's running for re-election after the Christmas and New Year's holidays. That's according to White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. The president turned 80 last month and is already the oldest person ever to occupy the Oval Office. Russia says a third airfield has come under attack by drones. State-run TASS News Service reported that an oil shortage tank caught fire after the drone attack at a Kursk region airfield. Two long-range bombers were damaged in Monday's attacks. Ukraine hasn't confirmed it carried out any of those attacks. The attacks were the furthest penetration yet on Russian soil since the invasion began. And Bloomberg's learned that the U.S. and the European Union are considering new tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. It would be a part of a bid to fight carbon emissions and global overcapacity. It's a novel approach. The U.S. and EU would use tariffs, usually employed in trade disputes, to advance their climate agenda. Warner Brothers Discovery will once again sell HBO Max through Amazon Prime. It's an attempt to bring millions of new subscribers to its flagship streaming service. Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zavlav Zaslav is reversing a move by the previous leaders of HBO Max. He's looking to boost revenue to pay down billions in debt. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
market's anticipating right now that we get significant rate cuts starting in the second half of next year. And we think without severe economic weakness to justify that, we're going to get the Fed pausing but not cutting. Rebecca Patterson of Bridgewater, thrilled she came on after the bombshell announcements of a challenging set of weeks for Bridgewater. And also, I would say, for Global Wall Street, really find us on YouTube and out in the digital space uh, for that complete comment from uh, Ms. Patterson. She was really, really something yesterday. Lisa Bramitz and Tom King, John Farrell preparing for a 9 o'clock episode of the open uh, as well. Red and green on the screen. We're looking at the curve inversion. Negative 83 basis points is important. Amory Horton is in Washington, and she is looking at the challenges of a president uh, traveling. But first, we get the weather report from Joe Matthew in Atlanta. 100% cloud cover. Rains ebbing away as they will. Joe, to be serious off your comments earlier in the downpour, yep. is weather a factor for the future of these two Senate candidates? It's a huge factor. If this race is going to come down to turnout, and I think we all agree on that in this runoff in Georgia, then yes, the weather is a big story today. Look at this pea soup behind me. You normally would see Peachtree Street and, uh, and a gorgeous view here from the 26th floor of this <clears throat> building that we're in right now. But of course, you can see what we're dealing with. And both of these candidates have turnout challenges on their own. Herschel Walker might be a little bit more obvious as we've seen the early voting trends yeah. leaning Democratic. We know that Warnock beat him in the last election. But Raphael Warnock, who I watched last night at a local brewery in his election eve closing argument, begged people, don't be complacent. He said, vote like it's in emergency. Don't listen to the stories about early voting. Tom, he even urged people to call their ex and tell them to vote and <laughs> well, then hang up the phone. Pick but it Joe, up there, Lisa. <laughs> Joe, I wanted to get your sense, though. You talk about early voting, and that's been really uh, huge. How much has that really already mm -hmm. driven the outcome before we even get to the pea soup of the day? Well, in a major way, we're talking about almost 2 million people who decided to vote early. I spoke with a Republican congressman from the 1st District here in Georgia. Republicans uh, are not typically those to embrace early voting, but he said, look, we've got to change the way we're doing this. People need to get out early. It's part of the strategy now, and it's the only way to win an election against a Democrat. Has there been the waltz of worthies through Georgia this time around? I do recall... The first Tuesday of November, although it wasn't the first Tuesday, that's a different story. But there were a lot of people waltzing through Georgia helping. Have they been helping yes. towards this vote? Well, last weekend, we did see a couple of uh, folks help, a couple of senators. We, we've seen Herschel Walker surrounded by the likes of John Kennedy and Lindsey Graham. Uh, last night, you know, Raphael Warnock was on his own, although we did see Barack Obama in town about a week ago. He's made two stops here. Uh, this has been uh, it's just a very, very different approach on both sides of the campaign. Walker did a half a dozen, or I should say Warnock, did a half a dozen events over the weekend. He's doing a lot of interviews. He's holding rallies. Uh, he, you know, he's showing up in, in public places where Herschel Walker has been pinpointing his way across some of the northern reaches of Georgia, some of the more rural areas. He showed up at a, uh, at a, at a, a gun range and a tailgate party yesterday to make his closing arguments, doing no interviews. In fact, the press has been largely cut out from his campaign. Just real quick here, Joe, the significance of this particular runoff election, what is it? Mm-hmm. Well, look, it's, it, 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 you can frame this in a couple of different ways, but I think you're reaching to 50-50, 51-49 here. If, he, if, if, if Raphael Warnock keeps his job, Democrats control the committees in the Senate. That means judges. That means nominees. Having control over the agenda and the bills that go to the floor. If Herschel Walker wins, Democrats already know that world because they've been living in it for the last two years. Joe Matthew, thank you so much towards the results of a Democratic vote uh, in Georgia today. Right now, Amory Horton joins us in Washington. Haven't even asked you, Amory, are you leaving on a jet plane for Arizona today? I don't even know. Are you? <laughs> no, I will not be there, but our Jenny Leonard will be there. Uh, interesting moment for the president, yeah. right? He's, <clears throat> he needs Arizona, by the way, if he's thinking of 2024. So. Really stunned by the different conversations we've had on this. I may be a new deglobalization, a manufacturing in America. How can anybody be against that? Are there Republicans or Democrats against semiconductor manufacturing in whichever state it is? No, not really. I mean, think about it. This has to stem from the CHIPS Act, which had uh, a lot of Republicans sign up for and wanted to see that push through. So this is this is a win 
for, obviously, it's a huge win for Arizona, right, for the jobs and the manufacturing that's going to become, um, but also in the sense that when you look at how America was dealing uh, at the depth of the pandemic, still reeling from the supply chain issues and the kinks in the supply chain, the fact that so much of the semiconductors are coming out of Taiwan, this is going to give the U.S. a little bit of leverage, but we should put it a little bit into context. The wafers, a little bit part of the semiconductors, the amount that will be coming out of both these two plants. Remember, one uh, is uh, about to be operational, and the other one they're going to talk about that they're going to break ground on is about 4% of the global supply. So it's still minuscule when you look at what Taiwan is producing. But from a national security perspective, from a, you know, buy and make in America perspective, this is a win for Democrats and Republicans. Do we have the workers, Anne Marie, to fill these factories? Oh, that's a great question because at this moment, there's potentially bipartisan deal on dreamers because this is not just something that and you see that from arizona senator uh kirsten cinema she's one of the democrats that is trying to work on getting this through potentially before christmas or into next year and greg valier is talking about it this morning in his note because <coughs> politicians are starting to see something that economists and people like Lisa, John, and Tom have been talking about for a while, which is a super tight labor market. The fact that we need more workers and well, potentially this dreamers and re immigration reform, if it's done in a bipartisan way, uh, could help some of that slack in the labor market. When you talk about the industrial policy, one thing stands out to me. I saw this documentary about Chinese workers in some of these factories and how there's an entire ecosystem training people around some of this production. Where is our ecosystem? ecosystem to bring people into this fold since this is skilled labor. This is very highly specified types of positions. Yeah, it's a great question. I think this is why the president, not only when he talks about wanting to bring manufacturing back to the United States and he wants hard infrastructure in the United States, he also talks about the fact that he is supportive of the unions. And that is where a lot of these skilled labor individuals come from. Um, but it's a great question because the United States clearly has a very tight labor market on the services industry um, as well as the manufacturing industry. And <clears throat> this is something that they are going to struggle with the next few years out. Emory Horton, thank you so much. Greatly appreciated. And a busy day for Washington. And again, the president travels. Our Jenny Leonard will be with the president. There are research notes that come across uh, the terminal and you stop. You do that with one Matthew Mish, who both Lisa and I adore. He is a legend at UBS. And he just published a note I think is fascinating in the bond world, Lisa. Bonds beat loans next year. The coupon wins. And how much is this also because you've seen leveraged loans uh, <clears throat> potentially face more credit risk because yeah. they are an adjustable rate, right? It's a floating rate instrument. So that means that companies have to pay more as yields rise, as benchmark rates rise, yeah. which create this technical issue. And we heard this from Amy Wu Silverman. She's concerned about leveraged loans. Right. She's concerned about how much money has been raised in them and how they could potentially reprice. For many of us, including me, to be blunt, this is wicked inside baseball, but we want to bring this to you. There's much more than just quoting the 10-year yield or even the 2 10 spread at a negative 83 uh, basis points. Loans, are they part of the shadow economy out there that selected few are concerned about? I mean, are they it's, visible? They are less visible than bonds because they don't trade publicly. There's a larger <clears throat> point, though, here. You say that we don't want to do too inside baseball. So let's go broad. The point here is to your zombie roll-up thesis. How do we get there if you don't have companies that have to refinance in the near term and don't see the ramifications of higher rates yeah. because they've locked yeah. in financing costs for a long time? It might be through the loan product, through the floating rate uh, kind of spread. But that's the real issue, right? Could we sustain much higher rates than right. people currently think because of some of these locked-in financings? And within the restructuring folks that we will see uh, in the next year, so much of it, least is not only the bond back and forth, but also the cash input or the equity kicker you have to give away as you readjust and, and, and reset almost. As what happens if we don't get a recession? What happens if we've got a gangbusters first half? I think that's half? a brilliant, brilliant question and was germane even nine months ago because, boy, has this been not a missed call, but just we just delay it. And quite frankly, would you agree the vast majority of people that we speak to, they're still looking for the recession?
No Everyone question. thinks that there's going to be a recession and it's baked into the yield curve. Yeah. How do we get there if things are still going so well? Well, we will have to see. It, it will be an eventful day. And of course, we get through this week into the incredible importance of what we see next week as well. Futures, well, uh, futures at negative two fractional, the VIX 20.63. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Radio, on television.